Oh my goodness. Hello! I thought that I clicked start broadcast and I hadn't, and here we are. So three... We're, having, we're late because we're having great discussions that you haven't heard. <laughs> oh, I thought it was on, man. This would have been perfect. So three, two, one. Hello and welcome to The Good, The Bored, and The Ugly, a podcast about board games and maybe a few... A few other things here and there as we get started in this Halloween season. I am joined tonight by not only our newest inducted member of the panel of amazing co-hosts here at the Good, the More, the Ugly, TC Reed. How you doing, TC? Doing great tonight, Joe. But TC has his better half joining him, and I'll let you introduce her, TC. Uh, this is my uh, wargaming partner over here, my uh, <laughs> wargamer extraordinaire writer, uh, my wife, Carissa Reed. Hello. I drug her into this um, forcibly because um, <laughs> I like hearing her talk. <laughs> <laughs> I like putting her awkward situations. <laughs> Tonight's a, a writing night for me. So yeah. I'm, she gave I'm up a writing home, night. I'm not writing. I went well, out thank you. typically earlier and did a bunch. So. Wow, thank you so much for joining us. Apparently you did it a little bit more with honey than with vinegar though, right? Because we're going to be talking about a pretty pretty big game for the two of you. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited to talk about it. We've been wanting to talk about it again since we, uh, uh, one of my former podcast, we um, talked about like just the beginning of it. And I've been really wanting to go back after talking about it after a full cycle. But that's Sweet. a teaser. Ooh, Ooh, teaser. teaser, yes. <laughs> it's, it rhymes with schmark and schmorer. So <laughs> schmark anyway. <laughs> just so, <too> tight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, it's uh, Halloween season here, so me and TC were actually just just figured out that we're both big buffs on horror movies, though, of course, I'm going to have to get high and mighty here and say I'm more into the pure horror movie experience of being scared and frightened, while TC is into the campy, crazy, rowdy Ronnie Piper, They Live, and John Carpenter, and, and well, a whole fistful of brains, and... <laughs> Evil Dead. Evil Dead, yeah. <laughs> and this, dead. this would make so much sense because you're like, you love Eldritch Horror. Well, to me, that is so, like, oh, oh, no. You guys mentioned Evil Dead. I really like Evil Dead. To me, Evil Dead is like, I feel like I'm getting a shot of just nothing but adrenaline. Like, <laughs> why didn't I, it's like, oh, my, what, what is this? It's kind of funny, but it's so intense. <laughs> it really is. It's like that drug he takes at the end of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. He's like, this is pure, <laughs> this is pure canine adrenaline. <laughs> or I forget what it is, but it's something, it's some sort of like maybe human adrenaline. <laughs> That's the way but, Evil Dead is amazing, and the new one was like holy. It was more horror focused, I think, than the older yeah. ones. But oh my gosh, was, there was more blood and crazy. blood in that thing. It was nuts. No, no, I no, loved it. Was it was you like the cabin in the woods? Oh, oh, oh that God. was so intelligent. Oh, I, I love that. that we definitely have some intersection there. <laughs> we do like those ones are really intelligent. I can appreciate those ones because they're intelligent, and and uh, Evil Dead just has some sort of an undeniable spirit. It almost. It almost feels like they like you've got rabies, you know, like <laughs> there's, there's rabies involved somewhere. A human being with rabies is the only thing that could make that type of a movie. So, oh, yeah, that's yeah, I mean. no, so totally love horror movies. And that's the one thing I get my wife to watch because otherwise it's, you know, she watches her rom coms alone. I watch. Well, I watch anything, but <laughs> the crappy rom-coms, I ruin those, just like I ruin crappy board games. <laughs> well, it should be an interesting episode tonight, because I think I got a whole list of bad board games to talk about. Yeah, oh, he was reading I, it off to me. Are they, I was going to say, I've never heard of them, so. but well, that's I'm, also because we're going to be talking about some obscure board games, because we're going back in time to prior to 1990. Ooh, way back machine. <laughs> yeah, there's... Yeah, we're, it's all going to be stuff that's that you would consider classic, you know, like there's there's some Avalon Hill, there's, oh, there's some 18XX, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we have to do it because I, you know, one of your co-hosts said if we didn't, he would like carpet bomb the house over here, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, and yeah, speaking of co-hosts here, it's, um, you know, Andy can't make it. Andy will be here next week. Uh, today we're recording a little bit, uh, we're recording at the normal time tonight. Uh, but Andy's not going to be here until next week. He's just kind of alternating back and forth. Has uh, a bit a short-term commitment, but it's regular. So we're trying to get him on about every other week for the time being. Uh, and we had Trent, uh, Trent, Sig, uh, Trent. I'm sorry, Trent Ham was uh, planning to be on this show, and literally minutes before we were going to start recording. Um, he had an emergency come up, and I just hope that all is well. 
it sounded like it was it was more of uh, an, an issue with people that he knew, and so he was more needed as in in sort of like a counseling capacity. So anyway, uh, let's let's all hope for the best, and and uh, I'm sure you know uh, with with Trent knowing Trent, he's definitely needed in wherever he's at. So anyway, hope that all goes well, and. Uh, yeah, we got Chris with the fill in for a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got, we got, we got fill in. <laughs> so she's yeah. yeah. So she might be she might be a little bit more. Chrissy, you might we might be kind of stretching the commitment here. So you were just going <laughs> to talk about one game, and now now we might kind of want you on here a little bit longer. So uh, I understand we'll if you can't. I understand. Just give me what you can. So anyway. <laughs> Well, she'll um, keep me in my place. We can't talk about that crap. Yes, we are. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, I, I can't wait for that. that. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I'm usually that's, the one going, what, do it. Do it. Do do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> really? You're the one. You're you're like the you're like the pitchfork sitting on TC's shoulder. The, Pretty much. The TC. I'm both, I'm both the white angel and the red angel. <laughs> the um, angel and the devil going, you really shouldn't do that. Do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, honey, I love you. Wee! <laughs> in Twilight Imperium 3, like, you're the viruses, TC. You know what you have to do. <laughs> and he's sitting yes. right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I do now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, welcome to everybody who's watching us live here. It looks like we got a couple of viewers. We got our pop-out chat going, so if you're listening to this and you hear this, uh, jump on, say hi. It looks like we've already got Norm out there. So Ryan hey, and Norm, it looks like. Link so. Up here for us. Uh, oh, oh, I didn't share it. So yes, TC, here you, yes. Uh, hold on, let me click on the right thing on our Hangout so I can share it with you. Here you go, buddy. Uh, awesome. Uh, hey, Norm, hope everything is well with you and yours uh, over there in Philadelphia for the time being. Uh, anyway, and... Uh, Hope that some things will be finding you pretty shortly. Uh, Norm is Norm is is a guy I've been talking to quite a bit recently. We're gonna be we're, you might be seeing a little bit more of Norm, but that's a bit of a bit of a teaser. So anyway, and I'm not Who's I'm Norm? not actually going to develop much on that. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man. That's really awkward. <laughs> Gosh. So anyway. Uh, Hey, yeah, anybody who's there, just jump on, say hi. We're right here listening and, and responding. So I see what you said there, uh, Norm. So thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll also be welcoming anybody else here as we go on. Uh, the Good, the Board, and the Ugly is sponsored by Game Surplus. So maybe we'll even see uh, Carmen from Game Surplus join. It's always fun to have him on. And we never talk any business, which is really awesome because uh, <laughs> Carmen's a really awesome guy and knows games really well too. So anyway, check them out at gamesurplus.com. And you'll be able to get some amazing customer service. And uh, they've got an ever-growing and expanding library of games. He's headed over with Jeff Gamble to Essen Game Fair. And you should be watching the Game Surplus Inventory because he's taking – he is responsible and largely for bringing over games that are not being discovered in other places. So that's something to watch for here in the wake of Essen Game Fair over in Germany. Anyway, that's uh, what I've got to say about GameStarPlus.com. It's an amazing place to go and buy your Wait, games. Essen. I buy my games there. You Essen should was Concred, wasn't it? Yeah. Was. Uh, we played Inside Joke here. We played Pandemic Season 1, and the first city to get an outbreak was Essen. So we called the mm. disease Concred. <laughs> Concred <laughs> broke out at Essen. That makes sense. <laughs> Oh yeah, people gonna yeah. Poor poor Edward at Heavy Cardboard had a had con crud not yeah, too long ago. So. Really bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll happen. So anyway, I get it. I get it at the school, but uh, yeah, I had we it like it from last school. week. Yeah, we get it from school. Oh look, our children are back from school. They look sick. Oh boy, guess what? We're getting in a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll get to you eventually. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we got we got our chat going. We got everything up uh, ready to roll. And if you check out in our comments below, you'll be able to see uh, ways to be able to reach us. Comments below this YouTube, or I guess if you're listening to it, I will say these things really quickly. Check us out on the Board Game Geek Guild 2173 on Board Game Geek, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Good Board Ugly. That's uh, something I use as a personal Twitter. So always going to be seeing things. Uh, anything that's coming out from from the media empire, which, which uh, may, maybe it's going to be called the 
the no name media empire because I'm in, I'm in so many different things, man. It's tough to say, you know. You got the good, the bad, the ugly. Now I'm I'm I'm, I'm here with you and the long view TC and yeah. and I've got this video review thing and I don't have a name for it so it's the no name media board game media hmm. empire the no name I, and like I think that. I'm actually ripping off of your suggestion there Norm uh, when you were when you were tossing over some things uh, some ideas for what to call our our uh, our community of listeners which is right now fractioned in like 15 different directions which <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's bad, but I, am I? Is it bad that I'm happy that we have all these different competing <laughs> viewpoints? Not really. I mean, that's kind of what this is all about. So anyway, I want to be called. I want to call you guys renegades. Other people want outlaws. Other people want, you know, GBUers and Eastwoods and all kinds of Ooh, crazy. I like stuff. Eastwoods. So, Eastwoods. Yeah. Is pretty slick. There's an acronym: Swags. Swags. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't forget. Think, I, I forget everything. Is that spaghetti western? Spaghetti something. western's nice. Yeah. Uh, spaghetti, spaghetti Western. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. So check us out. We got a an amazing crowd of individuals. Uh, cardboard in, cartel. Yeah. <laughs> the cardboard cartel. A, a norm yeah, just like sinister man. Like the. <laughs> I like it. It's pretty intense. Just uh, Norm hasn't met us. Just let you know you have. There's a. This is a living, breathing female war gamer. So if you have any questions you want answered, there's the person right here to ask. Uh, no. <laughs> we need David Attenborough here narrating this in yeah. a natural environment. Yeah, that's I know, a right? It was being that aggression. <laughs> it was. Goodness gracious. Playing it on the board. <laughs> Well, she drives you towards a lot of those war, ga war games too, TC. I mean, that's that's really cool. I mean, you got like the historical basis that a lot of those things have really interests me. So, and you guys are experts on the field. Well, it's nice well, when you uh, play Paths of Glory and you're like, what's this event mean? And, you know, she can just rattle it all <laughs> off. I'm like, oh, that's actually kind of cool. <laughs> what's happening yeah. to you now? <laughs> that's right, man. That's, yeah. It's was, interesting, he, yeah. He was very shocked about trench warfare and what that actually meant yeah because he's like i'm just gonna charge i was like no you're not yeah <laughs> no the, like the the front did not change for like uh -oh. several years like the, yeah there was a reason people didn't go anywhere yeah well it changed just by feet <laughs> <laughs> okay all right yeah. i stand corrected yeah. I stand corrected. Cool. Yeah, we gained a foot today. Yeah, but then they went back and got around and yeah, yeah it's it oh, bad. Um, it's horrifically brutal but yeah it was anyway not to derail too much but any Sorry, questions we got here excited <laughs> <laughs> yes yes and i think some of these games that we're gonna be talking about from pre-1990s are avalon hill war games maybe they'd be in your wheelhouse maybe they're a little bit you know maybe even they're kind of dinosaurs i'm not sure but we'll we'll figure that we'll out, figure when out we go down the list if we if we still have the treat so anyway i'm not going to talk any longer because i want i want carissa to be able to join us for as much of this as possible <laughs> let's go ahead and kick things off here uh, TC, why don't why don't we just go ahead and start with the discussion of of Arkham Horror, but not just the Arkham Horror LCG, which is what we are going to be talking about, but Arkham Horror the card game, together with its entire first cycle. You take it from here, sir. Okay. Well, um, last year, uh, of course, um, Fantasy Flight announced uh, Arkham Horror the card game, and I was really intrigued by it because they claimed it was an LCG meets a role playing game. I was like, wow, you know, me and Carissa, we kind of cut our teeth before we board game. We role played a lot. And you, Carissa, actually ran some pretty good uh, Vampire the Masquerade campaigns. And what else did we have? We had several. What didn't we have? Yeah, I know. We, 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 D20, all that stuff. Yeah. So I was like, hey, honey, you know, we got this. We, we liked Arkham Horror, the board game. And we really enjoyed it. And Eldritch Horror. And uh, you weren't too hot on Mentions of Madness Second Edition, though, were you? No. No, she didn't like. She like she liked like running the game against us, and when they, that thing took over and became a, an app, she was like, "Nah, I'm not interested anymore." So luddite. Yeah, she, <laughs> I luddite over here. Oh so boy, we, yeah, it must be cardboard. Well, maybe these pre 1990s because you know they're back yeah. when it was when it was pure. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. <laughs> so we got the we got the core set and we played the the mini campaign and Carissa, I won't speak for you too much, but you were pretty underwhelmed by it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're like, you know, this is really not, you know, you're still building a deck and I don't like building decks and all this stuff. But well, it was the whole, you know, you, we need to play this because it's got this whole role playing aspect and then we're playing it and and it was cooperative, which I enjoy, but where's the role playing? Um 
So, but I think part of it too is it felt like the same rehashing of all of the other Arkham style narratives. Uh, it, it didn't seem to have any real surprises in the first few. That mini campaign that yeah, came with it. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, eh, I feel like I've done this before, just yeah. in a different mm -hmm. format. I mean, you're getting, you I mean, instead of getting screwed by a die rule, you're getting screwed by the chaos bag. Oh. You, know, you reach in, you're like, oh, minus whatever, or yeah. instant fail. To me, the chaos bag was just a die. I didn't see anything really different there. You could have just handed me a D20. The only difference was I could have scratched out a few and, and changed a few other ones, but it was still a D20, basically. I think it was pretty yeah. soft. That. It's our opinion on the chaos bag has evolved yeah is that an opinion? Ooh, did they start playing with it though it definitely had more yeah. things like more potential than just a dice yeah yeah so <laughs> we we were kind of that said look honey i i know let's just commit for a full cycle of this the first story and see because i know you're big you were curious if they could even tell a decent story because fancy yes. flights i mean they're not really known for stories <laughs> i mean they're not they try yeah i I'll mean give them that. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> they try. I, you yeah. know what? I'm, I'm a writer. I have a writer. really high bar. <laughs> and then, plus well, and we I'm, on... I'm a our HP Lovecraft. Like, oh, yeah. I, I've, I've like read it all. I love that stuff. And to me, the it's it's like reading fan fiction online, and not particularly good fan fiction. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was my issue. And then this was hot on the heels of the uh, time crisis fiasco, yeah. time stories fiasco. Oh, where I hate time stories. stories with a fiery passion. Man, we we might see eye to eye way more than I figured, Carissa. I like oh, you. Oh man, I was <laughs> I was the first first time story run was fine, and then mm -hmm. it just went. Meow. It did immediately, right? <laughs> yeah, it was like yeah. it was like a nosedive right after oh, yeah. that first one. That first one yeah. was like. Yeah, this really wasn't worth it, but it's okay. And then the next yeah. one is just like, Ew. No. I'd like a little time with my time story, please. Oh my goodness! <laughs> or, uh, yeah. If you have dragons in the name of your scenario, dragons, dragons would be, would be neat. You know, yeah. So that thing that it just went. And of course, I'm the gamer. I'm like, well, let's just give the third one a try. I, we should have stopped. I know. We, we should have been dead. Anyway, so <laughs> we were bad. hot off the hills of that. So. You know, we were like disappointed with stories and board games. We were, it was a good cooperative game, but we weren't entirely sure. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to $15 and what, what, $30 first of that big box and then 15. So let's just keep it going. And we played it and we played it. And then it started, it, it started getting good. I thought Yeah. it was the, the scenarios are starting to do different things. It, it added each time. So you'd finish like the first scenario and then what you achieved in that one affected the next scenario and so on because you're making notes yeah. after the scenario on who did you meet who got killed <laughs> <laughs> did you take any mental or physical trauma and all these carried over so that became a little bit more of a feel of a role-playing aspect uh which which yeah that was fun yeah i was keeping notes because there's a track that tells you all the different scenarios and you check them off as you complete them. And I was taking notes of this character got this mental trauma <laughs> on each one. So we have this little list of, of all of the evil that happened to our people <laughs> until they died. <laughs> yeah. And it, nice. it, 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 there's actually a, a really, really pretty neat story arc to the whole thing. Cause the, yeah, the first cycle was a sequel to the Dunwich horror. It's called the Dunwich legacy. So you're like, mm. you're like following on the heels of what happened. So like all oh, these, you're getting these professors. Like all the all the decisions you're making in the game have ramifications. Like, oh, yeah. Like there was a choice at the end of one was like, do you find the Necronomicon? Do, do you, you take it? Do you keep it? And we're like, you... and you're looking at this card going, this thing's amazing. You get all these resources and heck yeah, let's take it. And then you're like, oh, put this evil chaos token in the bag yeah. as a consequence for grabbing this book. Yeah. And then if you, then there's another <laughs> scenario where if you uh, if you don't succeed, it just it goes away. So not only did you lose the book, you still got that darn chaos token in the bag messing with you. Every time we draw, you're like, man, this is your fault for freaking, I know, right? freaking grabbing <laughs> the book and losing it, man. <laughs> and we didn't even we ran the whole campaign, but we didn't technically finish it because <laughs> we died. Because <laughs> we died. <laughs> died. So you just kept on seeing like you know our dead our dead uh, bodies walked over here. 
Pretty much. Yeah. yeah, it was it was bad. That was it. The second to the last. The second to the last scenario yeah, was. We and you like we wrote just, insane, we, we just insane. Really messed it up. Oh, and we, was... we screwed the pooch <laughs> on that one in a really spectacular yeah. and fashion. And then at the, and we got to the end, and we're like, oh man, that hurt. This is gonna hurt us in the next scenario. And we're reading the end, and it's like, and you're dead. And we're like, what? <laughs> what? Uh. what? Okay, then. I guess I'll need to buy that time next to, pack, huh? Time to make some new characters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny when you figure out, like, in one of those, like, choose your adventure games, like, oh, yeah. you know, like, uh, Tales of the Arabian Nights, when you figure out, like, yeah. like you, you kind of see the, the repeating, like, read passage 373, uh -huh. and, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I remember passage 373. That's the one that says, <laughs> you've died. <You're> died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we yeah. just we just had a really I mean we were I was like hey honey I got the new Mythos pack yeah. all right let's break it out let's do it let's figure so, it out so the chaos bag so for starters what is it they say to put it in a cup or they have a bag I don't no, remember, it, no it comes with nothing so you have to like provide your own bag <laughs> velvet crimson bag that we're like oh they'll fit here. right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We got Normus See? from Canada. We got the good old Crown Royale <laughs> green bag. Beautiful that's, for growing things. That's very good. Yeah, mine is like crimson red velvet. So we put Ooh. them all in there. And as we're running the scenario, it got to the point where it's like, okay, draw the chaos bag. And you're like opening it and going, eh. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like <laughs> the guy in Dune putting his hand into the box of pain, you know? <laughs> And then you're like, please don't be bad. And then we realized when we started saying things like, okay, I don't, I don't want to draw this. TC was bad at it. Cause he'd be like, <laughs> the whole don't thing. draw the minus two. What did we get? Minus two. The minus two. And so it came to a point where we're like, shut up before you even <laughs> don't, you don't say it. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, think happy thoughts, happy thoughts. <laughs> So yeah, it, it became a whole thing. Yeah, I was that like, I'm not and the that. the cards that you have to draw, the mythos. Oh yeah, the the encounter cards. The encounter we cards. We call it the fun cards. Yeah, <laughs> we're like, okay, here's your encounter card. Yes. Set it lightly in front of you. <laughs> yeah. Here's my encounter card. Okay, you go first. Yeah. I don't want to go first. No, you go first. You're the lead investigator. Yeah. Okay, I'll go first. So <laughs> God damn it! What the hell is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> and then we're like, oh like my god, flying... what happened to you? I don't want to see what's gonna happen to me. That's a flying douchebag and just flew me across the board. What happened to you? Oh, I gotta put a doom token on the thing yeah. and it accelerates even faster. Oh, and that's those great. change each scenario. You have different cards that go in there, so you don't know what's gonna be coming out at you until you start drawing them. And then you have to reshuffle <laughs> a lot and put them all back in the deck, and then you're like I know what's coming out. This is going to hurt. We well, remember that one scenario we had where we, we, we found that guy and we had to shuffle him in the encounter oh deck. Oh, my God. And yes. we were like having to go he through an encounter. evil. God, we didn't want to go through that encounter deck. I would touch oh. that thing. <laughs> yeah, there's just some rotten. It was fun. It was you know, fun. It wasn't role playing like I was accustomed to, but it mm -hmm. had the same sort of um, feel with the record keeping and um building the scenarios they were all different but it's still your character and they took with them everything that had happened to them previously <laughs> and including and bad cards that you bad put cards in your day. you'd start off with already lost health or lost um, sanity sanity so the campaign structure of it really put it this added. one up a level it did. It added quite a bit, and it was fun. It's like okay, it's upgrading we upgrading your cards. Yeah, you get to go through. You get experience points at the end of scenarios, depending. Depending on. <laughs> Not always. Yeah. Sometimes, Sometimes you just survive. You're just walking out, going, and now I'm insane. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's this one like I'm off running wild in the woods because I can't handle this anymore. <laughs> um, but if you got experience points, you could go through different. The way your character was constructed, there are certain like skills that each character had um, attributes from mm -hmm. different skill sets and you could go through and upgrade those cards. So you might have, you know, a, a weapon and then you can get it even better. Uh, and you could do that after each scenario, if you had the points to spend and that was fun to do because then you're like the next scenario, you're like, okay, that kick-ass shotgun is in here somewhere. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> Just waiting for it to come up. And then if you, you know, made it through the scenario without it coming up. You're like, what did I waste my, my shotgun? <laughs> it's 
So yeah, the card draw was interesting. But now, usually you as, hate that kind of stuff. I usually hate that. Yeah, I hate it. Where your hand is dependent on how the cards fall in the shuffle. But it actually with Arkham, it was just another aspect of how you could get screwed over. Yeah. And for well, Arkham, you, that works. For you, me. Have, you have weakness cards in your deck and you're drawing, going, draw three, uh, one, uh, two, <laughs> oh, crap, there's my major weakness. <laughs> I got to deal with this thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the first scenario or the first uh, campaign was completely worth it. And we kept talking about going back and running it with different characters. But then TC got word of a new campaign. Yeah. The Path of Carcosa. Yeah. And, well, that's, that's the cool thing about this game is like unlike time stories and stuff, you can actually replay the scenarios and you can uh, you can crank up the difficulty. Yeah. And, you know, it's so it's replayable that way. I mean, even though you know what's coming out, you can be like, okay, I'm going to try this thing on normal. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> normal. Then yeah. there's like hard. And then like the last level of W is called Arkham, which is like, you should just be called dead. <laughs> dead. <laughs> and it's, it's so, going to depend on what characters you have, too. It's going to change your gameplay style. Um, mm -hmm. And you know what certain things are coming out, but it's different in each scenario. So, you're like, okay, in the first scenario, we know this big bad comes out, and we're gonna have to fight him. So we need we want mm -hmm. some people who can fight and do the the take the damage. So kind but of then in composition, sort of like yeah, like, exactly. Like, it was really good with TC and I to have one character who was really heavy on the mental and the investigative, and another character who could be the brick. And mm -hmm. uh, that worked for us. Mm -hmm. And then well, until so, the last scenario. Well, until and the we last all scenario. Yeah. <laughs> we 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 divided the party so we could take more damage that way. Yeah. So <laughs> it was bad. And um, I think the last thing we can definitely see about this one in um was we played the the last in the new one, right? Yes. And we there it came with an actress. So I'm like, I just throw this together. And we opened up the the scenario and like there's this uh, section that said, if you play the actress, read this. So like it was mm. this whole story was centered around a character Carissa was playing, and at that you actually started role playing. That. I did. I was totally. You get these cards <laughs> to be like, like whispers of madness, and you couldn't show your your uh, buddy. Your buddy. <laughs> it specifically said, "Put this in your hand and don't reveal it." Where most of the other encounter cards you reveal on the table, so you each know how messed up you're going to get. Um, but these were specifically put them in your hand. And so, um, and they would be a detriment to something like. And they'd clog up your hand size. Yeah, it was they, all bad. It was bad. It's Arkham is bad. Um, but I started doing things like I can't, I can't investigate that because of the whispers in my head. And <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> but the the best part was there was this. We'll spoil this a little bit. There was this character called the Man in the Pallid Mask. Oh yeah. And it was just screwing with us the whole game. It was awesome. So. It's like it was basically said, this quiet man stares at you with hollow eyes and all this freaky. evil crap. <laughs> and, and we didn't, we didn't going into this one, we didn't figure out who the lead investigator was. We were just excited to play it. Uh -huh. Well, at the end of the scenario, it was like, well, the whoever's the lead investigator gets this weakness card in their deck. The man in the, the man in the pallid mask. I was like, we didn't choose, and Chris was like, he's mine. <laughs> This, this guy's going in my deck. He's, He's awesome. I don't care if it's a weakness. We're going to, yeah. He's she just cool. shuffled that thing in. So. so, yeah. I'm looking forward to the next yeah. one. So, yeah. Very, it was very interesting to see that game evolve from oh, something yeah. we just kind of like to like just, just insanity. It's nice to see thing. that in the opposite direction of oh, yeah. time stories. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. yeah. So, if, you, if you're disappointed <laughs> with time stories, if you're looking for a pretty cool role-playing experience, um, and you don't mind the investment because it is, you know, you know, it, and like Lord, Legend of the Five Rings only need two core sets, but that's only to play more than two players. Mm -hmm. They get the second core set we got so we could play three to four. Um, and it's a monthly cycle. So, yeah, it's it, it literally reminded me of when I used to play Dungeons and Dragons and we get new modules to continue the story. <laughs> Yeah, it did. It was that really, really, really cool. You can actually play this one with just one set as well. If you're gonna play solo, mm -hmm. just one one set of the game is okay, or do you do you think you probably need two sets just for certain cards? Well, um, I'm playing it solo and I'm using I, I built God, I can't believe that see I, I used to hate magic people because they talk about deck construction and here I am talking about it for a stupid mm -hmm. Arkham War. Uh, I found yeah. that to build a really effective solo character, you do need two cores, so you can have two copies of the card. But I think with if you buy like all the expansions that have come out with it, I think there's enough in there. You don't need to, because yeah, each mythos pack come with comes them. with like not only does it come with a new scenario, it comes with new cards. 
It's like a 60, mm-hmm. 60 mm-hmm. cards in the pack. So yeah. And then what's really, really cool is that if you just want to get on the path the card goes like you're like, oh the man in the pallid mask sounds awesome. I want this thing. But I don't want to like invest in the other cycle. You don't. You don't need any of those cards to start with the new cycle. So as long as you have the core set and the new cycle, you're you don't need yeah. any cards from any of the other sets, which is kind of kind of nice considering fantasy flight loves uh making you buy expansions out the yin yang and so far <laughs> they make you the, like him go ahead so so far the path to carcosa i mean just the beginning scenario was better than anything in the original oh, scenario. miles better it was wow. it was mind-blowing how it felt like that they had become more confident with what they were presenting in this format mm-hmm. cool well, i'm glad you guys enjoyed that um it, it sounds to me like you've already really had a lot of experience with this type of game and that this yeah. one is pushing it in a new direction that almost sounds to me like evolutionary. Like maybe mm-hmm. we'll see this happen more with these types of storytelling games and do some, some more continuity between different missions and stuff, hopefully. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's really interesting because, you know, I was kind of expecting with this one, like, you know, it, you know, Fantasy Flight has their LCG crowd. You know, I figured they'd be catering to those, but it was interesting. It seems like they just really branched out to try to get new players in. Yeah, well, I kind of, I think they kind of set a bit of a precedent with the uh, Lord of the Rings one because you know this. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. To me, like, it's a really cool concept because you can like skip a cycle and be okay. Like, it doesn't have that competitive tournament play. Well, I mean, it does if you want that, but you know, who. I, I, from what I understand, they actually do have tournaments and whatnot for this, but uh, and, and they can become competitive, which just seems bizarre to me because it's, you know, like there is Operative. that story. <laughs> yeah, there is really stuff that comes out as you're playing, and, and it's it's just an awesome system. I, I really like Lord of the Rings, the card game, and I, if I was more interested in the subject matter, for me, I just can't stomach the whole nuns on motorcycles. You know, it it to me... It it just seems like it's uh, it'd be like going and pouring, you know, <laughs> it'd be like going and pouring a bunch of just uh, uh, squirting a bunch of silly putty onto H.P. Lovecraft's grave, <laughs> <laughs> silly string, yeah, yeah. It would definitely it's like a I wouldn't call it a Lovecraft game. What they call it, Arkham Files? Yeah, yeah. That's what their subset is. So like, yeah, it's not really Lovecraft. It's it's kind of loosely inspired with like it's the action adventure movie. Of a Lovecraft yeah. story, more Pretty or less. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's Indiana Jones meets Arkham Horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much so. It, it is an interesting, an interesting thing. So I, I found that Mythos Tales is what I really liked for H.P. Lovecraft. If, if you haven't got a chance to check that one, I highly recommend it. It's like the Sherlock Holmes, but set in. I think we talked about it a bit. We did talk we? about that. Yeah. Yes. During when we talked to um. With Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So anyway, yeah, that's 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 been my uh, jam with it. So anyway, and I'm glad that you guys are enjoying this one though. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we'll be able to keep keep posted on this as you guys get more cycles played. So yeah, well, I'll let you know when it crashes if it ever crashes and burns. It will. <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> we'll boy. It's Arkham. It will. There's literally a rule in the core set that says if there is a uh, question about the rules, go with the worst outcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I feel like I should always be go when I'm playing a co-op. Yeah, pretty much. Makes it more. Otherwise, fun I feel like I'm like you know, like if I found out I win, you know, and it's like no, that wasn't the actual rule. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that wasn't a win. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. Well, What'd thank you, you very much for that. I got yeah. a, a consumable game. Actually, I have. A, a one of the escape the room games which i am just a, absolutely infatuated with i don't know what it is about those specific games but i can really push them maybe uh, you know they're like event games ones that i i can easily get a few people to play that one when they're like oh it's a one time you know there's something really special about it and i'm just a big fan of of puzzles but i want more than just a puzzle right the same way i'm with board games like i feel like puzzles in the paper are kind of abstract you know, like where it's it, a crossword puzzle to me is is very close to an abstract. You know, there's not really anything connecting those except for the abstract grid of words. Well, in a in an escape room, you can get the sort of puzzles that that I, that entertain me so much. But there's just 
exposition and story and, and a, a narrative, a place, an actual like physical place. These are things that are really nice that can come out when you're playing an escape room. And uh, I've played several escape rooms in real life and they can be prohibitively expensive. Uh, you know, hundreds of dollars. I've spent almost $200 to take six people to an escape room uh, to sort of treat family. And man, that, yeah, that hurt. That hurt. That was tightening <laughs> the belt for the hunger pains for a little while. That hurt. So it's nice when you can buy a game like Exit, which won the Spiel des Jahres. It's a banded cam and won the Spiel des Jahres for $15. And I recently reviewed Exit on the Cubist podcast by the amazing Bill Corey Jr., who is one of the, together with Jeff Gamble, between the long view and uh, what Bill Corey used to be doing, that I started showdown. Those were like two that really inspired me to get started in podcasting. And it was awesome to be like, you know, actually a guest on his program, The Cubist. So you should check that out. It's on Heavy Games. And I was joined by the amazing Clay Ross of Capstone Games. And I reviewed Exit the Abandoned Cabin, which did win. And I was actually informed that it, it was the specific one. Like it was yeah, just that I like game that. It's like, no, it was the one that won it. And you're it like, was, okay. <laughs> exit, not exit the whole series. No. And I was like, what? What? I thought it was just what? the exit. No, no, no. It was that one. Which is interesting because... Not the rest. Not the rest. <laughs> no, yes. Just that one. Which is interesting because to me, the Exit Abandoned Cabin is really disappointing. Like, you know, my review in a nutshell is I was very disappointed by that. And uh, it, it was just a bunch of things let me down. I felt like it was, it was competent, but it was not in any way interesting or outstanding. And so I went into the, the Pharaoh's Tomb, which is what I'm reviewing now, uh, the second one I've done. I don't know which one comes first, the Pharaoh's Tomb or the Secret Lab, but I just kind of chose it randomly. I chose the Abandoned Cabin, I think, more because it seemed like it was the first one in the series. But this one I just chose kind of, I think, uh, just on, on a whim. So we tried the Pharaoh's Tomb, and things that I'm looking for in Escape Room are I, I want to have, like, a sense of, of – place. I, I want it to give me, you know, when I'm in a real escape room, I have a sense that I'm in an actual place, in an actual room. And that's something that, uh, that I've struggled with in some escape room experiences. And I would say that the first abandoned cabin really struggled with that. The, the place that you were in the abandoned cabin did not really come to life. I did not like the way that it was, that it was laid out. It was not you know, I, I can't say much about the game without ruining the experience that I'm not going to. I'm not going to put any spoilers in here, but let's just put it like this. The Pharaoh's Tomb gives you a sense of place. It really does, uh, much like the Unlock series does, and very successful at that. It gives you a sense of place that you need to explore and analyze, which I really, really appreciate. A really cool thing to see there in terms of, you know, you've actually got to pour over these cards, which I didn't feel so much... Uh, was the case in the abandoned cabin. So, you know, like you really are like exploring it in the, in the same vein as a point and click adventure from uh, the, the, you know, the old Curse of Monkey Island and whatnot. And uh, the puzzles themselves, just wow, there is amazing use of what's, what is included inside the shrink wrap. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. It is really incredible. I think that the, the specific way that they used hieroglyphics uh, on the decoder ring were just, you know, they, they played with a lot of the tools at their oh. disposal. Uh, I just want to interrupt you for a second. Carissa is like a humongous Egypt nut. You read oh. about the Amelia Peabody books? Yeah. You and you, she, just, this one out. she is grueling over here. She <laughs> wants this thing. Oh, yeah. No, check this one out. It is, it, I would say this though. So the abandoned cabin, I felt like there was really not a need to destroy it. They could have easily made it a replayable game, obviously not by the person finishing it, but they, you know, you could have easily put 95% of that game back together and you only really destroyed a little bit. It was not, you know, not enough. And you even could have really easily avoided that just with a facsimile or something. Um, so I, I didn't understand why it had to be a one-time use either because Unlock is not structured that way. Here in, in the Egypt one, no, like this is a one-time use game and it, it is that way for a reason and I appreciate it and accept it for that. So just understand that, guys, that you're buying this and you're only going to play it once, but I think it's worth it. Totally worth your time. Puzzles are excellent, really high quality. Uh, it, it has one of those moments. It has a moment, like those priceless moments uh, that can happen in these types of escape room games and, and it very rare, but like where you just – you know, you realize that the way this puzzle is structured is like manipulating 
information content in such a novel way, one that I can equate somewhat to the uh, to the first time stories that had a pretty big moment uh, that that pushed you and and you know kind of almost when these unlock games break the fourth wall, but it's kind of how they break the fourth wall. And and this one, the Egypt one, genius. And I think you are going to love it. I really do. Yeah, we are always on the lookout for it. <laughs> I think our, one of our board gaming quests is to find a really good Egypt game. I don't yeah. think we found it yet. Although she hasn't played Kemet. No, I have not. She has not played oh, Kemet. <laughs> okay, yes, you've got to play Kemet. I, I don't know if it'll be your style of game, but it definitely does the Egyptian stuff in an amazing way. Really, really cool. And the expansion... The expansion adds more to it as well. So yeah, so that's but, yeah, I think. Yeah, so we will we'll definitely try it out. I'm mean, thinking, what was the other Egypt game? Yeah, it's been it's just like this eternal. It's like, what well, about this Egypt? No, not Egypt. This Egypt game. What about this one? Not this Egypt game. So <laughs> it's, a, it's been kind of a fun little roller coaster to go on this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, we yeah, it's a. Uh, just we're, we're being joined now by a few more individuals in our chat, so it's great to see Stephen, and it looks like Norm is now is now uh, just Norm, uh, but Stephen is is one of our listeners here who is joining us from down under, so it's awesome to, to hear from you, Stephen. He's really excited to talk about these older games. It sounds like that's a personal passion of his, so anyway, seeing that in the chat means it's about time for us to convert into our topic of classic games. So let's quickly press the button here and wait for the 10 hours of load screen to come through. Or actually, no, wait a minute. This is pre-90s. That's that's like the 90s. The 90s is the load screen. The 90s is like put in the disc, wait for load screen. The the pre-1990s is like the floppy you know, disk. Slap, you slap in that floppy disk. Yeah. You, know, you got to like sort of like blow on it. You got to wipe it off. Yeah. You, know, you got to like flip it back and forth. It's not working. You know, you take the cartridge, you slam it down, mm -hmm. you blow in it, you get your alcohol swab. Yeah. And then you get to running, you get to playing it. And 10 minutes before the ending boss, your game's going to freeze up <laughs> and and it's going to not work. And you're going to be like, no. And there's no save. There's no, no save. You're just starting over and, from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And at that point, you're like, man, I feel like using a cheat would be bad. But I feel like right now, up, this up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, B, A, the classic Konami code, man. <laughs> there you go, man. That's it. Yeah. Or oh, then you go go yeah. watch a movie on your VHS. Oh, I got to rewind <laughs> this before I return it. My dad still records things on VHS and still has VHS. Yeah, we have VHS players in my parents' house. Like, it is – it's he puts them on top of the Blu-ray players. I'm like, Dad, that's horrible. I can hear the Blu-ray players spinning. Like when it's spinning, it's like labored because it's like there's all this weight on top of it. It's like, <laughs> oh. yeah, oh, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna crank it back. I got a, I got quite the list here. It's gonna be fun. Oh yeah, there's a there's an extensive list. I do I I will do my best filling in here for Trent. He compiled an amazing list. I am not gonna be able to do justice to all of the games, but I'll do my best with the ones that are on there. So TC and uh, and and Carissa as well. You guys go ahead, jump in with uh, with your list here to start out, okay? Okay, well, I have to start out by, um, a Andy said we had to do it. So I had <laughs> so I have my obligatory honorable mention because he threatened uh, to rain down fire and destruction over here in Portland if we didn't mention it. Uh, and that is 1830 Railway and Robber Barons. It was a 1986 game from Francis Tresham. I have not played it, but you cannot deny this is a, a – probably going to be specifically talking about the Avalon Hill version. Um, you cannot deny the impact this game has had with the uh, players. I mean, this game is still played today. And in fact, I found <laughs> out recently that if you play a winsome game and you buy one of their games, you have to have the instructions to 1830 to be able to play them. So, yeah, mm. you can't. Yeah, and I could be wrong. I'm sure I'm going to hear about there how that's is not ones, true I think, or there, something. There is some that work like that. Not all of them, but yeah. like, uh, well, Winsome Games, not in, not all of them, but they will design. And I actually kind of enjoy that that idea. Like to me, it it gives it a little bit more. It seems to me like that. Like, why aren't more 18xx games like that? Because it there, you know, when you look at one 18xx game and another 18xx game, 
many of the pieces can happen to be interchangeable and some of them can even be shared, like especially regarding track. So I think one master set of track and one master set of poker chips would be interesting. Why isn't that on Kickstarter? I don't know. Somebody <laughs> on but the fact that you're they're they're using a game, and I think there was even a Mayfair reprint, but I've heard through the the, the community that that re 1830 reprint's not that great. I could, like I said, I just I haven't seen it, haven't touched it, haven't played it, just right here. But the fact that you have to have a game from 1986 to play a game that's published like today, that, that just speaks to the game. So, <laughs> you know, for what it's worth, oh, yeah. Andy, I mentioned all of these games somewhat. <laughs> well, most of most of Trent's, not so much mine. <laughs> I was going to say, I haven't heard of most of yours. Okay. So there we go. That's my obligatory um, honorable mention. You want to go to Trent's or you just keep trucking here? You keep going, dude. You, okay. You, you, how about we start alternating now because, yeah, you've got a few more here on your list than Trent. I'll, I'm going to have to skip some of them because I'm not going to be able to talk yeah, about I all of them. I think Carissa might do – like this one definitely for Carissa we'll oh, talk about. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, my first one – and this is not in any type of specific order. My first one is Wiz War, a 1983 game designed by Tom Jolly. Now, this has gotten the reprint love from Fancy Flight. I don't even think you played this one, Carissa, where I you're did. like wizards in the maze and you just have these <gasps> oh, yeah, crazy yeah. card I combos. I mean, that. the game, you could just pull off these horrifically hilarious. The, the twisting fireball. Yeah, you could like, I play this fireball, I throw up a wall, I throw you through the wall, back, it ricochets back, you take all this ridiculous damage just to get you to drop something so I can grab it from you and try to get out of this maze with yeah. it. Yeah. Um, specifically speaking, I think this game was one of the inspirations for um, Richard Garfield when he designed Magic the Gathering. So you can see that influence a bit. And when it was released in the 80s, I do believe it was like a cardstock game. And I remember when I played it, it was like some really not good components. But it was like, it was not very well. Yeah, but man, I have to remember playing this one and just you're going, hey, yeah, we're going to do this and do all this crazy stuff. And you kind of built your deck. And, and if you're interested in it, the Fancy Flight reprint is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We rented that one as one of those games we like, oh, we need to buy this. And of course, we never did. But... <laughs> But there we go. That's my Wiz War. Here we go. Wiz War. Wiz War. Yes. 1983 by Tom Jolly. Yeah, you guys did a great job with these lists. You even got your designers in there and everything. Man, that's diligence right there. I like it. Well, when you said it, I was like, oh, brrr. I was like, I got 25. I got to narrow this down. <laughs> if I did put a Trent's list, kind of, talking all night. I realized here that Trent has nine bullet points. He has nine of them numbered, but like, there's like five of them that have. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just seeing like, that. Like, just everything. <laughs> He's like basically anything by this designer. Okay, well the first one here, maybe we're we're talking about the first one. Like this, I feel like this almost should have been like the big heavy hitter at the end because I feel like Sid Saxon was, you know, he was designing games that were decades ahead of his own yeah. time. Can't and he was, stop this. He's done some. Can't sleep. stop. Absolutely. Uh, the ones Trent Trent put on here, he didn't say can't stop, but I would add can't stop is absolutely, absolutely incredible. It captivates people. It's I, I my wife loves it. It is just such a such a simple concept, so easy to learn, but so well executed. And it it yeah, it, it even has like, you know, it's all played on a stop sign. It's it's really cool. So he's also got here Acquire Sleuth, Focus Bazaar, Venture, Monad. Um I have played Acquire. And sleuth. <laughs> yeah, Acquire is a, is a definitely a game you, everyone should have to play. That is that is like the basis for almost. I mean that that's pure. If you like economic games, this is like you have to try it. You can just see where other games went from this one. Yes, it absolutely. Acquire is one of the most influential games that's ever ever existed for sure. I think you know in terms of economic games and the way that you had. You know, it's it's really like stock and acquisitions and a lot of really interesting economic uh, loopholes and and uh, ma ma machinations, ma machinations. Yeah, uh -huh. how do you pronounce that word? So, uh, sleuth is to me what Clue always wanted to be. It's really your excellent, an excellent, almost like the modern art. Because uh, I, I think Reiner Knizia is an excellent designer. I think that honestly, Sid Saxon is like the Reiner Knizia of the pre 1990s era and uh, modern, or, um, I'm sorry, I'm talking about Sleuth. Sleuth is almost like the modern art of deduction games. It is uh, very lean. It is very much a, it's a, I feel like it's a very player driven game. And a lot of times the information you get can be just as important from what you see other players doing 
and that's part of the deduction in it. And I, I think it's a really beautiful, fairly simple system. You know, it's a pretty simple like checkbox logic type style puzzle, but it's just the way that there's different ways information is gained. And just like in modern art, it, it keeps it fresh for the for the entirety of it, keeps me wanting to come back to it, and it is an absolutely excellent design. Yeah, so it's all done here from here, right? From Sid Saxon, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't well focus Here's won the, the spiel is Yaris, so it's yeah. <laughs> The Focus, Bazaar, Venture, Monad, I just don't know them. Do you have any, uh, like Focus, I know Trent, Trent's talked about as one of his first games really responsible for getting him into the board gaming. So unfortunately with, with him not being here, I can't comment much on it aside to say it was, you know, Spiel des Jahres winner. Yeah, I just, when my list is games specifically I played in, in the, in the early 90s. So it's kind of hard to comment on that. But I, I've played them. I've, the only one I've really played a lot is Can't Stop. And from that one, I got to play a choir, and then Sleuth is like, uh, I, 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 it's one of those guilty, you know, it's one of those things I need to correct in my lifetime. Place Absolutely, yeah. Oh, dude, Sleuth, yeah, I have it right on my shelf back here. Eagle Griffin has kept it, an amazing, you know, like it, it's a game that can be a smaller game and still be really awesome. So definitely check that one out. I mean, it's in their book, you know, their their smaller box for sale size, like twenty five bucks. 15 bucks, you know, depending on, I, I forget how much exactly, maybe 20 bucks. It's really, really good, really worth it. So let's go to my next one here. Number two, Shadow Lord, 1983, a Parker Brothers game by Brad Stock. Now, this was a game I picked up when I was in elementary school, and my poor grandmother bought it for me because I just really wanted it. It is hands down one of the most bizarre board games. <laughs> I have owned or have ever seen. It's by Parker Brothers. Yeah, and it, it basically has a... Do you remember a movie from the 80s called Crawl? Uh, yeah. I can't, no. Okay, it's got this bizarre... I mean, you're playing the game, and it's like it's really cool. It's like outer space, but it's got this cheesy 80s fantasy theme thrown on top of it. So it's like got this identity crisis going on. But it was pretty instrumental for me because it was you know it was how you move how you execute things you could upgrade your characters you put little plastic pieces on this ring how far you can move and it just stuck with me because it seemed so eclectic and weird and we managed to find a game with this and we've played it within the past year or two and i just went to look it up on board game geek and i saw that they actually had a designer listed on it and i'm like oh that's crazy turns out the designer of this thing designed the sequel to paths of glory called pursuit of glory like a World War One game. So I immediately reached out to him, and this is how I started my um, connections with GMT designers. I said, what is this game? What happened? And it turns out this game, when it was made in 1983, was supposed to be a Star Wars game. <laughs> Get this. It was so a Star they Wars ripped game. out the Star Wars. But they ripped out the Star Wars game <laughs> because Parker Brothers didn't see any value in the license because it was 1983, right after Return of the Jedi. And interest just tanked in Star Wars because if you remember between, you know, Star Wars didn't pick up till like um, um, Timothy Zahn did the Thrall trilogy books and then Star Wars started picking up again. But it was like that dead zone for Star Wars. So I'm like, oh, OK, now it all makes sense. That's why I kind of liked it. So, um, yeah. So if you find it and you see this thing like for five bucks on the shelf and you just want to play something crazy and just off the wall. And it's Shadow Lord with an exclamation point. So when you say you gotta go, Shadow Lord. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And then nice. again, you know, we've I've talked about, you know, I hear like, you know, good games will get reprinted and bad games done. But I would love to see a reprint of this. I I'm gonna send a letter to Restorations Games going, man, you've got to take a look at this crazy thing. <laughs> it's gotta be worthwhile. It seems like it'd be good for that. Yeah, for that mark. <laughs> I've I've heard, yeah, Restoration Games is definitely interesting bringing back some of those old titles. <laughs> yeah. Well, next up on Trent's list here is Diplomacy, which no, breaking Trent, friendships. <laughs> yes, Trent turns every game into a game of diplomacy, and I think he would basically say that this is one of his favorite games of all time. My experience with Diplomacy has been it is just such a pure negotiation game. Yeah, it's, it's mean. you know it's nothing mean, else to dude. it. I mean, you're you're in each other's faces right away. Like basically, the game sets you up, lets you essentially make one sort of strategic move. And there's kind of almost a scripted start in many situations, but you can always like break from that. The game does give you at least a little bit of agency there, but uh, really like things don't get started until you've got an alliance. And uh, you know when you can get a couple of people on your side, and you're like, all right, we're taking out France. <laughs> you know, and the one game I played was as Germany, 
And since I've been playing as Germany, I, I then listened to Dan Carlin's Hardcore Histories, who did such an amazing job of cap capturing the stress I felt. I was like, oh my God, like everybody's my my enemy they're all on all sides that, of me what am i supposed to do that game could be a mind screw and you find out who your friends are playing a game of diplomacy oh, oh yeah goodness. what i mean like if it happens though i feel like you kind of have to leave you kind of have to leave your you know you got to really leave any baggage you have at the door almost yeah. like by baggage i mean you almost have to leave any friendships you have at the door yeah, and then you get them back up on your way out. Yeah, when you play you diplomacy, can't... you have to say whatever happens at the table stays at the table because I've been to conventions <laughs> with diplomacy where I've seen people lose it. I mean, just absolutely lose it. And, yeah, it was just that game storm. Oh, my God. I even saw pe seen people in tears over diplomacy. So at that point, I'm like, I, I want to try this game. <laughs> Yeah, it's right up your alley, TC. Yeah. It's a mean, <laughs> mean game, but yeah, it's but again, it's one of those games where you can see, um, you know, its impact it had because this oh guy, this the sixty. It is just incredible, man. I think yeah, the impact it is also just such a solid game, totally yeah. relevant still to this day. Yeah, and it's a world. I mean, Carissa still wants to try it because it's a World War One game, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, but yeah, uh, definitely uh, diplomacy, oh, definitely yeah. worthwhile. Better than what some of the crap I got on my list. I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> I it's, think TC though, you did a great job of filling in some gaps here with yeah. some nice little comic. I, I, I just, I, the keep. Yeah. So let's talk about that one. So um, yeah. So um, here we go. My number three is the keep, 1983 from Mayfair Games, made by a bunch of people who probably don't want their name attached to it. <laughs> now. Full disclosure. Brothers. <laughs> uh, full disclosure here, I love F. Paul Wilson. He's like one of my favorite authors, and I love the book. I went to go see the movie, and I was like, my dad was like, I don't know what you took me to see, <laughs> which was kind of a theme that year because I think Dune came out, uh -huh. and he had you know, giant worms. Well, man, he, he was just lost on that one. Uh, <laughs> so this movie, but like, dude, this movie has nothing to do with the book I like. So I found a game, the board game, and there's actually a Dungeons and Dragons module. And the board game's actually pretty neat where you're playing the, the bad guy, Molossar, and you're trying to prevent the soldiers from finding this talisman that will... Um, get rid of you but the 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 um take is is that you have to like eat your own people because you're a demon right <laughs> so you're trying to prevent these guys from finding the same one for take but you have to like consume your own forces <laughs> it's, just, it's like you're trying to eat your, and plus awesome. yeah and then plus the cards are like actors so i have like there's ian mckellen card <laughs> there's a what's the guy from the 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 submarine movie who was Cedric Kane. Oh my god. Yargon uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the Gabriel <laughs> Green, right? It's like, it's like, it's just this crazy. I'm so disappointed I got rid of this game. I've been looking for it forever. And there's like one copy on BGG for 50 bucks. I'm like, I can't justify 50 bucks. For this <laughs> my wife will kill me, but just to have it would be great. But oh, this, 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 this is hilarious. Yeah, so there you go. Your own people. <laughs> <laughs> this, this bananas. So there we go. That's my number three. <laughs> All right, over it's here we got. Risk. Yeah, <laughs> we got Sherlock Holmes consulting detective. Wow, yeah, go, like, yeah. Let's have Carissa bring you know talk about this one. <laughs> but I'm I'm sad that I didn't actually play it at the time because I was mm -hmm. so into Clue that the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective would have blown me out of the water. I would have burnt all my copies of Clue. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, because Clue, it got to the point nobody plays it with me anymore. So, uh, you don't have to roll the dice. You're like, there, 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 no, done. No, that is such an exaggeration. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, it's a brilliant game. It's all based on narrative and deduction. And uh, I, I, I mean, yeah. I just can't talk about it enough. I what do you think about the writing in Sherlock Holmes, like, compared to what we were talking about earlier? Like, let's why don't we even go as far as, as, far as to compare them to the – the newest, latest, greatest thing from Fantasy Flight, the Arkham Horror LCG? Um, well, it's actually based as a narrative where the LCG has um, what I would come closer to saying prologues, epilogues, and flavor text. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you it's story-driven. Um, it's like a choose-your-own-adventure um, mm -hmm. with page numbers yeah, and newspapers <laughs> and, newspapers. <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, you have basically you know somebody comes into 
uh, to see Sherlock with a problem, a uh, mystery, and uh, you are the Baker Street irreg uh, regulars, and uh, you have to try and solve it um, better than Holmes or faster. You have to oh. compare yourself <laughs> yeah, to Holmes. That. <laughs> yeah. And that never happens, basically. No, I don't You're just solve it within how... the time allowed. It's always just like... Well, we get to the point where it's like, well, we've just blown this out of the water because Holmes will probably have solved it in like five steps by yep. going to five different places. And we're already at like 25. So, you know, let's just let's just go let's everywhere. Keep looking. We're screwed. <laughs> we're just going everywhere. Where's the list? We're going through the list. Um, so, yeah, you go to these places. You read out of the book that has all of the, uh, uh, the story in it. So you go to a location. You read that excerpt and it'll either tell you uh give you another idea of where to pursue uh the mystery or uh basically tell you oh that guy's not home <laughs> you just lost a point <laughs> which, which nice. happens yeah <laughs> um <laughs> yeah and it's written like a story there's dialogue description uh it's fun it's a cooperative mm -hmm. um and and that's all it is. There's there's no paperwork except taking there's no board. Amounts of notes. There's like a piece of paper. Yeah, there's a map of London. <laughs> paper map. And yep. there's newspapers for each case. So you'll have ten cases. So there's ten newspapers, which are cumulative. So you have to keep track of all of them as the game goes on. And so uh, by the end, you're shuffling ten newspapers between all the players to see if there's even anything. <laughs> teensy piece of information in classified but, subtext yeah. so yeah. it's it's really good if if you enjoy deduction games uh and sherlock holmes it's it's a fun one second that all right i guess we're up to me here uh number four um i'm a big like i said before i'm a big dungeons and dragons fan and one of the Dungeons and Dragons settings I really latched onto in middle school was Dragonlance. Oh yeah. We, me, and then Chris, because we just read the Chronicles, <laughs> Legends, all of it. They actually <laughs> made a Dragonlance board game. I got to I play it. I missed that. One. And it was plastic dragons. And the, whole, the, the game was like complete. I mean, it was. It was. <laughs> I don't think it's that good. I haven't played in years. But you're trying to get the Dragonlance off this tower. But the really cool thing about this game was, <laughs> yeah, I know. Go ahead, laugh. It doesn't fit. The dragons had like where that. They had altitude, right? So you had like, they could be either like really high, medium or low. And that's how oh, combat that's cool. worked, you know? So like if you're higher, you had a better chance of hitting if you come in lower. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it had like this three-dimensional aspect to it. It was like this big beast of a game. I I'm, I lost pieces of this thing all <laughs> over the place. My dad was finding dragons all over the place. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it's one of those games that no one played with me either, right? Oh, it's kind of yeah. sad. I but I remember liking it and it was fun. And it was neat because it had the altitude and stuff. And it kind of reminded me a bit of that tail feather scene that came out by a plaid hat. But instead of dragons, it was birds. I'm like, oh, who wants that? <laughs> I want dragons, right? So a uh, fun game from my youth. Played a bit. I remember it being neat. Tied into a fantasy setting I liked. And I don't know if it holds up today, but what the heck? It's there. <laughs> Dragonlance, 1988. Number four. That's quite interesting. It sounds like they did more with that specific world and that specific idea than I would have expected. <laughs> we did too. Oh, we did too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, Bonkers. Norm says his dog ate all the components to that game. <laughs> <laughs> what were they? They were like plastic, right? Yeah, they were plastic. That dog is probably pooping dragons for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm actually now going to talk about anything with an Avalon Hill logo. Yeah. So, so Trent yeah. definitely threw me under the bus with this one. Um, I'm actually going to pass off one of them to you here, TC. You mentioned 1830. You've already talked about that. I'm going to pass off the next one to you, but I'm going to talk really quickly about advanced civilization or civilization, whichever one, the, Cid, the uh, Francis Tresham by the same guy who designed 1830. Uh, civilization is just an absolutely incredible game that's really – uh, almost like running the logistics and the and the uh, tech tree sort of cultural outputs of a civilization starting in absolutely nothing, you know, antiquity. It's it's a game that, in my opinion, is one of the like depending on people's uh, definition of heavy game, it is absolutely a a pinnacle of what it's going for. And at least by my estimation, by the way that heavy games is being defined by many people. 
Um, and, and many people, at least in my spheres uh, of, of, you know, interaction, is that, you know, games that have not necessarily complex overwrought rules, but just a very deep, deep system to play with. And in my opinion, Civilization is about the epitome of a simple rule set, but an absolutely endless, bottomless pit of strategy. And it's still played to this day, still relevant, uh, inspired, among others, inspired uh, Sid Meier's to make the Civilization video game, which then in turn inspired Vlada to make Through the Ages the board game, which made this amazing transition from board game to video game to board game. And I love all of those products. <laughs> so it, the epitome of civilization design started with a game from Francis of Tresham called Civilization or Advanced Civilization. You should check it out. It's an Avalon Hill game. And now I pass off a game that our chat has specifically yeah. mentioned, TC, and they would also like to hear you compare it to its newest Fantasy Flight edition. But please take it from here. Okay, well, I want to say Advanced Civilization's a beast if you play that thing. That thing will take days, but it's good. Oh, yeah. But anyway, we'll talk about Dune. I'm coming from the guy who plays Twilight Imperium 3. Just ig yeah. ig ignore that. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> if the, the, the reason Dune specifically isn't going to appear on my list is I didn't get a chance to play this in the time it, frame it came out. I have played it subsequently, and... If for people who don't know the game, it's from the same designers as Cosmic Encounter. It's a very, very thematic. It really fits the book. And it's an incredible... I think Dune is an incredible war. It, it started me on my wargaming path pretty when I got my hands on it. and But I actually got my cut my teeth on Dune with the reprint, the Rex reprint that Fantasy Flight put out. And I like it just as well. I, I catch a lot of crap from a lot of people by saying this, but uh, Rex actually tr it cuts down the game time. It makes it like only five rounds, so you're talking about a two- or three-hour game. It It's one of those games where once the mechanics, even with Dune, especially with Dune, once the mechanics of the game, once you understand the rules, everything just fades out. You're literally playing the other people, and I love games like that. And you're making alliances and you're trying to like get in and win and then with the timing to break that alliance when it comes out to get a win and then maybe then the Rex you can like throw the trader card out. You will hear a lot of people talk about Dune and Rex and saying it's broken, that this thing is overpowered, that thing's overpowered. I've discovered with subsequent play of Rex goodness, how many times have I played Rex, Carissa? Oh my god. I've played Rex a lot when that thing hit. And I've discovered that it's really understanding what things can happen and how to use that to pivot it to a win because there's like a there's some combos in there just like just when you when it comes against you and you don't see it coming you're like holy crap there's no way to beat that combo there's no way but there's ways around you just gotta know how to do it it definitely rewards players who have played it often yeah and for that case that's my birthday game is and Rick's. i have a fail safe strategy <laughs> when playing not necessarily to win is i just attack tc over and over again <laughs> until he allies with me <laughs> wow that's <laughs> that sounds like a bizarre mating ritual there Carissa. <laughs> no, no comment I, but what, I, what I always tell people when it comes to rex and dune is that if you don't want to fork over the money to actually get a copy of dune which I think the cheapest copy we found was a print and play company here in Vancouver. It was like like 120 bucks to do a straight reprint. If you can find you Rex for guy. like 50 <laughs> or 60 bucks, do it. Try it and see if you like it. And if you Does, like Rex, go get Dune because it'll be worth the investment. Okay, so Dune is definitely worth it, but Rex will at least let you know whether or not you like it. Yeah, whether it's your style of game or not. Yeah. Okay, because it is it is similar, but you still prefer Dune, or do you get out Rex instead? What do you, I, you just play? Just because I cut my teeth on Rex, and plus I'm a big Twilight Imperium fan. You know, I just like I like having the turtles and the. But man, sometimes it's like, dude, I want to be Harkonnen. Yeah, I want to I want to be Harkonnen, or maybe the Space Guild, and like dictate <laughs> how the, and 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 it just works. Jerry was saying being the the Fre Fremen or the Fremen, Fremen the yeah. mindset of you're a terrorist, and I I said to that <laughs> like it's like. It's, uh, I don't understand. I, what's the reference? What is it? What is it, Chris? Or? <laughs> well, the Fremen are basically, uh, 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 they're the natural habitants of Dune. 
and they've been repressed. They've been sent underground. They're oh, trying so they're to like protect, guerrilla warfare. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they they really are. And then they, they like they like know what's really great about playing the Freeman is like you know where the the worms go. See, look, when you harvest spice and dude, there's always a chance that the giant worm's gonna come up and just wreck you. <laughs> and like the the Fremen are it's immune like, to that. It's like tremors on steroids. Yeah, <laughs> I could talk about Dune and Rex yeah. for hours, but needless to say, if you don't have the money, you're curious. At least get Rex, try it, see if you like what that game's doing, and if you do, go, and you if you like Dune, it's a no brainer. You got six people, <laughs> go get it. <laughs> Just nice. realize it's out of print and it's going to cost you a bit of bit of change. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Well, that is uh, that's one that you kind of ended up getting shoved on you. Now it's still your turn here. Oh TC. yeah. Okay. So here we go. My number five. This is Dragons of Glory. Now this this game is the one that really kicked off my war gaming, and this happened back when I was in oh, middle I school. That was... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Dr Dragons of Glory. Well, us, we were talking about Dungeons and uh, Dungeons and Dragons modules, and specific Dragon Lance modules came out. And you played a module, and you played the campaign. Like the mm -hmm. first one was like Dragons of whatever Despair, I think was the first one. And you ran a campaign, and you went up against you know you find the discs of Mishakal, and oh god, I hope, I hope people understand what I'm saying. I'm not talking a foreign language. I know language. exactly <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> so we, I, I bought all these right, and then I think it was the eighth one. I opened it up. And like it's this hex map of Kryn, and all these chits come out of it, like little war chits. I'm like, what <laughs> is this thing? This isn't a role playing game. I'm gonna get with my group and play. Turns out it was a war game. They wrapped as a Dungeons and Dragons module. You could like, you could play the the armies, the dragon high lords against the armies of Kryn, and they're little chits with little stat numbers on it, and you moved them around. And I was. I was fascinated by this thing. I oh, I tore this game to pieces. I had to like tape the map back together because it was just um, <laughs> paper. But and you had to you had to provide your own dice because it was like a magazine, right? So I had to like rummage dice because of course you're playing D and D. You don't have like a normal six sided dice, right? You got like D twenties and D fours and all kinds of crazy things. But I had this yeah, this was. This was very significant on my wargaming path, and I played it, and it was such a pleasant surprise. It's like finding a game and going, oh, this isn't what I wanted. What is this? Oh, this is pretty cool. I'm going to play this a lot. So, yeah, that's a Dragons of Glory by Tracy Hickman and Douglas Niles, 1986. Interesting, yeah. It's a war game, but it's almost like it was in a RPG clothing. So <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it snuck in, man. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like, oh, you know what? I am going to, so number five on Trent's list was Euro Rails, and I don't have anything to say about Euro Rails because I've never played it, and I don't think about it, unfortunately. Um, Next. You know, yeah, so, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to supplant one that you just, you just put the idea in my head, and I'm going to have to say this, man, Magic Realm. Speaking Ooh, of yeah. a war game masquerading as a dungeon crawl, Magic Realm is your war game for the RPG player. So it takes your fantasy races and and uh, fantasy monsters, and you've got like eight to 16 different um, heroes you can play as, and you start, you know, like you just go around on the map, and there's going to be a lot of battles that you're probably not going to want to start and fight. <laughs> I think that it's similar to an RPG in that most of the, most of I think the fun in the system can come from the sort of discovery aspects and the discovery of interactions, um, but I definitely think that it can have a little bit more because there's no like DN, you know, dungeon master there. It can feel like you're a little bit scripted towards whatever your hero specifically benefits from. I think that the heroes that play magic are really where the people who enjoy magic realm are most excited to play. Just kind of like your really advanced D and D players are more interested. Sometimes if they're not necessarily that invested in a story that's being told, they can be very interested in sort of the magic you know, because the, the spell casting can be a really deep system that requires almost like study of tomes, like you would imagine <laughs> from a game. So I think that Magic Realm can kind of feel that way a little bit. I think the magic is the most interesting uh, probably way to play the game, to do things using magic instead of just using your normal chits. Uh, there were some interesting things going on, though I definitely struggled with uh, what felt like a game that was more of a simulation of a fantasy battle or a fantasy adventure than it was me actually uh, participating in, in in the storytelling, which is just you know impossible to do uh, without a dungeon master. So, what do you have to say about Magic Realm TC? 
Oh, um, it's, it's a game I haven't played, but I've heard about it and I've seen other people play it. And I, I, I really want to get a game of this in. It was like, it's like the box cover has this really '80s cheesy wizard on it, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, he looks very much like a like like a bad version of the Gandalf from the Hobbit cartoon yeah. movie, or like those 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 fortune tellers in the box, you know? Oh yes, <laughs> very much. So. It, it looks pretty bad. Yeah, but yeah, I'm, my good friend David uh, in our local group here. That was one of my first gaming experiences with him, and since then we've really kind of almost grown a bit together in our game taste. But that was what he came here like, just really, really loving, and and he still has a really soft spot in his heart. But since then we've played a lot of other thematic and mechanically interesting games, and less more, more less of a simulation and more of you know. A, strategic and tactical experience well i don't, I don't want to say you know whatever but uh <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to step into any pitfalls pit holes there but things have changed a little bit but i know he still has a soft spot in his heart so he's got he's like print and played it and even used like some sort of plastic and printed all the all of the map tiles onto like some sort of plastic it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy but and he owns like two other versions of the avalon hill game so i mean you know when you own three versions of a game you one know, of which you make likes yourself, it, yeah <laughs> uh-huh so definitely check that out if that sounds interesting. If you're if you're a hit, uh, Hex Encounter War Gamer, check out Magic Realm if you're interested in fantasy. Okay, let's see here. My number six is um, a game that I played when I was in my youth, and I actually found a copy of it fairly recently. It's uh, The Hunt for Red October, 1988 by Douglas Niles. Now, this thing was published by TSR, and that's how I first came to my attention because I was going to oh, like that the, was Oh, uh, that was D&D, right, before... Yeah, it, that DSM was Dungeons Dragons before uh, Wizards of the Coast bought them out. So I'm at the at the store and I'm looking I'm like, oh, a TSR game. I pull it out. It's like Hunt for Red October, and it's designed by Douglas Niles, who wrote a lot of the Dragonlance lore. I'm like, okay, why not? And I played it, and it's 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 dated, but it's a very very extremely light war game that's simulating submarine <laughs> warfare in World War Three. So the name's kind of a misnomer because there's like one scenario where actually one person's a Red October and the other's a Fleet's Going. The rest of it is like this mess of, <laughs> of counters and displays, and you keep them hidden. And you send out, you send out like air, you send up, yeah, you send airplanes and submarines and and destroyers and stuff, and you're rolling dice and finding stuff. And yeah, if you get that last scenario, which is like the World War Three just erupts everywhere. And you have another person to play with you. It's pretty cool. And one of my great regrets it's not in gaming. Just a game of tic tac toe. No, yeah. no, no. And one of my regrets work. is they actually made a sequel to it called Red Storm Rising, where you could merge the boards together and have a four-player game. And I don't even know if they made Red Storm Rising. I think this was just like a. And this was this was before the movie came out. This board because it's based on the book. So it's like, I'm like, man, if I could ever find Red Storm Rising, because now I have a copy of Hunt for Red October now, I would love to smash those things together and just see what the heck was going on with this thing. Wasn't, isn't Hunt for Red October the ones where you had the, the shit you flipped over and then you could put like, yeah, you put the, yeah, to do the, it? Uh, yeah, it was, really it was, neat. it was a cardboard you, you, um, folded in half and put in a stand and then the damage counters you slipped in between it. Yeah. So it kept great. track of damage. It's really, really for what the components were back in the day. It was pretty mm -hmm. early. And it all smashes inside a Monopoly sized box. Those flat boxes that are really long. <laughs> really thin. Wow. So you're like smashing all this together. Like, I gotta get this thing in. You know? <laughs> but, Jeez. Yeah. So there you go. Hunt for Red October. Nice. Uh, well, next up on my list is in an amazing game. I believe another one that won the Spiel des Jahres, a very influential game called Scotland Yard. Uh, one of the best hidden movement games there is i i think though there's been there's been games that have really taken this system and run with it and i think it's been influential in in games like nuns on the run even more so letters from Whitechapel to me is is the most uh like direct descendant mm -hmm. and uh i i think though that there's still a spot in my heart for scotland yard because as a family game it really works it has a really crunchy um, like this, like when you see, when you play Scotland Yard, it has a family feel, but it does have this like, man, where, what direction is he going? And it does have that cat and mouse, really great, great chase to it. 
However, the thing that makes it more of a family game, more of a lighter game, is that the bad guy himself is just forced to reveal himself at certain intervals. So, you know, it, it, it always, like, you always kind of have, I don't know, you can just play, like, magnet ball if you want to, like, because that's what I call it when you watch, like, little kids playing soccer where all of the kids run to the ball, it, you know? <laughs> I, it's just magnet ball, so I feel like you can do that with Scotland Yard and still win. Um, well, but plus, I think you don't that, want to break out letters from Whitechapel, and it's not really a family-friendly uh, game. No, <laughs> if you want to take it to the level, play letters from Whitechapel. It is really a great iteration, but there's still a place for Scotland Yard. It's still being published by Ravensburger, I believe, and uh, it's it's definitely though earns a great spot. Like, there's a lot like. I was like, oh man, games from pre nineteen ninety. What what are the good ones? And it's like, holy crap, man, we've we've got down this list. And and uh, I, I'm not gonna say anything about your your weird dragons hunt for Red October and TC. Your your list is is really hilarious. I feel like it's some nice it gives a nice little bit of of jam in between the slices of bread here on the, the trends made. <laughs> well, it's a, it's an insight to my childhood, is what it is. <laughs> well, it's the it's same. Like I, I mean. Too. I mean, oh, <laughs> it really is. I'm on Chris's side here. All right. Oh, so, so that what was Scotland Yard. Oh, what? oh, yeah. Carissa has a few she wants to do. So why don't you interject some? Okay. Go well, I I forgot because he was asking me what games, you know, classic games. I was like, I was boring. We had Clue, Clue Monopoly, <laughs> Uno, Trivial Pursuit, and then I remembered one that um, I played. It was it kind of set me on my whole Sherlock Holmes thing, and that was Two Twenty One B Baker Street, which is. Like taking Clue and stepping it up just one level and adding Sherlock Holmes to it. So you have the board with all the buildings and it's not a cooperative, it's a competitive. And you have this little card that you read um, the mystery, uh, the case that has to be solved. And then you go around picking up clues and uh, you write them all down. You've got a little sheet, you keep track of everything. And then if you think you know the answer, you go back to 221B Baker Street and tell everybody, I think I can solve it. And then it's got the clue feel where like, was I right? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that one really set me on my interest in Sherlock Holmes um, because it just, it was for someone who the epitome of a problem solving game was Clue running into this um, it, and because it does have a bit of a narrative because the case cards are, you know, an actual case you're reading about. Um, it just opened my world <laughs> a bit. <laughs> it's just kind of that step between Clue and Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. No, we played, we played that one fairly recently, too. We have. And it's, we, it's I, so I have an old copy of it. And then I was at Target like last year and they had the same copy, like the original artwork and everything for like two bucks on a clearance shelf. And I was like, mine, <laughs> I've got one and now I've got two. <laughs> I don't need two, but I have two. <laughs> what a shriek. Look at my it's name. Two dollars. It's two dollars. Yes, I have a Somebody mint condition. Someone must love this game. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Nice. What's next on mine? Oh, this is going to drive Joe up the wall. Yes. My number seven is Fireball Island, 1986. Chuck Kinney and Bruce Lund. Okay, Fireball Island. What is Fireball Island? It is it's 3D chaos with marbles and dice. <laughs> um, I mean, I remember having this game, and the box is just so ridiculously big for it, and just, you know, to, to accommodate that 3D map, because it was a foam 3D map insert thing and yeah so you had to put this head on it and you just rolled dice you had to roll and you know go get the get the gym and then oh you had to stop on the bridge and someone rolled a one they could let this marble go down and this thing would knock you off the bridge and then you have to go down and you're playing these take that cards up I mean, no you lose a turn no i get the gym and if you just pass someone you take the gym from you so you're just trying to get to the first you gotta find the gym and you're the first to get out and the reason this, I played it a few times, I remember back as a kid, but what really brought this one back to the fore was that game night 
a few nights, a few Wednesdays ago, one of the guys actually brought a copy in. And, <laughs> J- and the store owner and some other guys, they had like way too much beer to drink <laughs> while playing this thing. And I watched them play it. And it was the most out of control thing I've ever seen in my life. They were like just throwing cards and cussing and having fun. And they, they couldn't even like hit the the head right with the marble like shoot the other way and they get all pissed off but <laughs> that just, it just reminded me like oh man i missed something this <laughs> retarded this is so, so mindless right just something as a kid you're just like having fun just doing is it balanced no is it fair no but you know it's like oh just a big take that game from my youth i was like oh Another one of those games is probably off with the keep somewhere. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we, we, what happened to TC? <laughs> Fireball Joe. Island is, is mousetrap. <laughs> Dismissed. <laughs> it's just mousetrap. It's mousetrap, and instead of instead of it having all these pieces that you got to put together in a Rube Goldberg machine, it <laughs> is just a giant piece of plastic that has... It has like Marbles. rails that the marble can run down, and, and it's it hits just your dudes. Like, and it <laughs> like just to give an example, how random this whole game is is like the guy who had it was playing it, and like all these cars that even though he got canceled, he could go again and go in. And he was like one space away from winning the game, and he's like, okay, all I have to do is survive as long as no one rolls a one. I've got Why it. Why do you the, say those And the things? guy who owns the store rolls a one and just freaking wipes the whole thing out. <laughs> It's like, oh, it was so funny. Then they drink more beer. <laughs> <laughs> there you nice. go. Fireball Island. Is it good? Probably not. Is it entertaining? Oh, you bet your butt it's entertaining. As long as there's beer involved. Beer that... involved. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I'd I feel like I'd be much more entertained by having a beer at the top of Fireball Island <laughs> and having a glass at the bottom of Fireball Island, having it drain into that so I can just drink a beer. <laughs> And not have to actually play it. <laughs> so my number seven here on, on Trent's list that I've now done a couple of modifications. I unfortunately didn't know Stratomatic Baseball like Trent did. So Well, um, I don't know anything about Stratomatic either because when I was growing up when you were a nerd, you didn't like sports. <laughs> so, <laughs> I always Trent kinda... loves sports, man. Trent loves like the – he loves like the money ball type sports. Like he's he's in like five different fantasy football leagues and has like all these different like you know sort of um, formulas and stuff that, he, yeah. that he's like practicing in all of them. He's you know, yeah, yeah. He, he, he's hilarious to talk to listen to about it. We'll have to we'll have the the next episode we're on together. We'll have him do a um, a review of Stratomatic Baseball because I want to know what's up with this thing because I hear all this good stuff about it, but I'm like. But it's baseball, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, <laughs> but again, I'm not the. It's not I'm not the, uh, the audience for it, so I can't rag on it too much. <laughs> okay, I see what you want to go ahead I, with. I'm going with D Mocker instead. So oh, I'm going to talk goodness. about D Mocker, which is a pretty big one to mention. Uh, it is a pre-1990 game, very much a game that still deserves relevance. It simulates an election system and a Euro game. It, it's just such an amazing way. To me, it is just so thickly, like, it's like the birth of German, you know, these masterful German designs that have that have really been the renaissance, the or I guess the rediscovery of, of board games. You know, kind of like what Nintendo did with video games after the Atari, you know, after Atari sort of faded away. And, well, I guess it wasn't to fade away. It crashed. Yeah, it went um, bye-bye. <laughs> Well, that's kind of what German what German board games did to the gaming and tabletop industry. I think at least uh, that's that's where I kind of sit with it, and it's it's grown exponentially. Yes, there still would be all kinds of games all over the place, but to me, um, that's really what's got me most interested in this hobby. And I would say that Demacher, what's amazing is how it simulates the German election system, but it does so in a way that's kind of like you score points from all these different elections that happen in these different states and your party is literally just manipulating the issues at, that can be depending on what version you have one of them is hilarious it's like these genetically modified foods and so it's like a picture of a square tomato <laughs> was that the but valley yeah, hill like, edition 
Uh, yes, I, I yeah. had that. I own that. Uh, you know, Valley Games, the one that, you know, the, the horrible Valley yeah. Games that, like, stole a bunch of people's money. Money, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a Rick, train Rick wreck. Rick something like that, that that, like, ran away to Australia. Hopefully, Steven, you can find him and go <laughs> find him and give him, give him uh, you know, 40 lashes or whatever. Yeah. So – D marker, I I played that twice. I mean, it was three times. But that first game, I'm like, I have no idea about German politics or how the German election works. So, in order to prepare for the second game, I had to actually go research how the German <laughs> politics work. So, but it's a beast. But it's you could definitely see that. I mean, that was God. I think that was one of the first. I think you're right. That's one of the first Euros out there. I mean, that is about as Euro as Euro Euro can get. Is, is D marker. <laughs> <laughs> we got private eyes steven um on it he's in our chat and he says he's he's on it nice on it. go for it so yep. we've got double so d mocker though to just to to say something about i think what's really cool is you've got like this hand of of cards that are your sort of uh members of your cabinet they all give you special abilities and you choose when you're going to use them because there's all these there's like between four and six, I think, different elections. It really depends on number of players, I think. But, you know, each of them is is very similar. But what's different about them is that in these different regions, they have different priorities, and they have different and, – and sometimes the bri priorities will literally clash from one region to the next, and you're only able to modify your platform a little bit. But you can go back on promises you made to win earlier elections. It's <laughs> democracy at its finest. Yeah. And it's, like, it's almost like like I live in Iowa, so it'd be interesting to see an, a, an American version of this because Iowa matters way too much during our elections. And I, as an Iowan, am like, why do you care so much about <laughs> us? Like, we are not remarkable. And, and, and honestly, like, I'm thinking about all these people in my extended family, and I'm like, you know what? I leave it to the people on the coast to make the calls. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, <laughs> and, and many times I, I feel like, uh, yeah, like at, at, at family gatherings, I have to be a little bit quiet and, you know, especially when you get, get a, a couple of drunk uh, family members. And I've got, I've got some, you know, I, I really love my family too. I mean, there's some really good people, but uh, yeah, it, it, it can, uh, it can feel a little bit depressing when, when I understand, you know, when you hear some of what, what kids – anyway, I, I'm getting down a rant here. I'm sorry, guys. d <laughs> play it. Try it. Make it. Make yeah. Somebody who's, who's a designer here, listen to what I said. Make an American version of this that's based on our primary system that involves uh, the, the Iowa and the New Hampshire. Make it before they change it because I will <laughs> bet you that our political system is going to be changed yeah, you in, be, you know, in, in, my la in my lifetime – Yes, it is. It is not going to stay the way that it is. <laughs> that was the mocker. Let's see here. My number eight, um, Starfleet Battles, nineteen seventy nine, by Stephen V. Cole. What makes this one interesting is that the publisher on this one was Task Force Games, which later became, I think, Amarillo Design Bureau. Which meant that this game was published in the city I lived in, which made me. I mean, come on, I was a Star Trek nut. Right, and then, then find out that this game was published <laughs> and designed by someone in my city, and this is like a miniature game. I mean, I remember you had like string, like to see if you like if like your phasers hit other ships and stuff. But they only had the um, the Paramount's gave them like pseudo rights to it, so they only had like the ships from the original series. So you're talking the old uh, '60s ships, the Klingons. But man, I love the design of the Klingons. I love the Constitution class, and they were like, and these minis were um. They're pewter. They were metal, not this plastic junk from nowadays, right? I mean, you're you're putting together metal pieces, and I'd like you know, draw your circles with the shields and the string to fight, and I'd have all these rule books, and I'm like, <laughs> and I could like you know, the guy who designed it was just around the corner, literally, and oh, oh, I had so much fun with Starfleet battles back in the day, just simply because it was it was something that was really accessible, and I <laughs> knew the people who played it and it was designed in my area. So yeah, I don't know if anybody else has played it. I think it still has a following. I think they still publish stuff, but there you go. Starfleet Battles, 1979. <laughs> nice, nice, interesting. I uh, am going to be talking about <laughs> some interesting games here. Yeah, this is going uh, to. Yeah, this is going to cry. This, this next one's going to correspond with my next one, so we can talk about it together. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Well, I will leave you. I will leave you to talk about. Do you have any experience with Fortress America? 
You know, I we own a copy. We own. I have the fancy <laughs> flight reprint, and it's still we've never played it. Yeah. I own that too. That one had some pretty pathetically small miniatures, as it I did. recall. It was sad. Yeah, but they're they're not a full box like StarCraft or anything really nice mm -hmm. like that. So, uh, but I'm going to talk about Axis and Allies, which I've got a weird history with. Um, I, I started. Think everyone playing... has a weird history with Axis and Allies. My first experience with Axis and Allies was playing the computer version on like my like an old Windows 95 computer. It was you know it was like against AI, but you could play you could play like kind of a pass and play, except it wasn't the device getting passed; it was the the chair getting vacated. <laughs> so anyway, you could do that, and I did that with my cousin when I went to visit him. And man, in in a week, we played probably five six games of this in a day and that was for like a whole week it was because you could get a game of it cracked out in like an hour hour and a half um you know with two players about an hour and a half usually if you're playing it by yourself you could play against all the ais in like 45 minutes when you knew what you were doing and it was because the game took care of everything and so i like you know my buddy got this copy of access and allies and it experienced a game or two of it at a family gathering and he's like oh this takes all day and i was like nah not that <laughs> game not that game that game takes like 45 minutes and uh, I'd never really considered that because the computer took care of all those rules that it could possibly last forever. Like, it was 45 minutes before we'd even gotten through the first person's turn with all those rules. And Yeah, so we ended up deciding to do something else. <laughs> so... I, I thought it was fun to play on the computer when all these other things could melt away. But man, in person, there is just so many rules. I've heard a funny comparison that's like, you know, if you if you want risk and you want to spend all day digging through a rule book, play Axis and Allies. Axis and Allies, even when back in the day, that had the reputation of being the heavy, I think they call it heavy games, but it was like the beast of the game to play. And I, I played it quite a bit and I am, I am almost convinced that anyone who hates dice was probably traumatized by Axis and Allies at some point in their life because this game is literally the definition of buckets of dice. I mean, you're throwing mm -hmm. dice in people's face in this thing, and if, you know, if it comes up right, you could, like, wipe crap out depending on the, <laughs> the order it comes out in because, you know, certain... You know, there's an order to battle. If you just roll really well, you're just like, you're gone. And you're like rolling all these dice. And it's like, oh. And then, you know, taking out someone's economy. And yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's good. Well, I don't know if I'd call it good. It's, it's, um, uh, it's definitely, <laughs> has, it definitely has its place. And it was definitely enjoyable in the time. There's I would, a lot of people that still love it, man. A lot it of people sells like a lot it. Of copies. I would, I would. I liked it. I would probably sit down and do it again if I had the time. But my problem is, I'm like, Axis and Allies are here. I stand. Yeah. Mm, I think we're doing here. I stand. Yeah, guys. I was gonna say, man, I mean? with with the way that the GMT games work, no yeah. question there. It's what do you just, think, Carissa? You know, I have actually never played Axis and Allies. Um, mm. It was just not something that anyone around me played. I've played Risk um, yeah, quite yeah. a few times, but. No, I'd heard of it, but I didn't really know anybody with any experience with it. So All right, still, homework. Force TC to sit through a whole game of it, please. I have a used game I bought for four yeah. bucks on my shelf. It's, it's, <laughs> one of my, it's one of my shame games. Yeah. <laughs> I should play. And I've even heard that with the, the Avalon Hill reprints, you can take like the, the – you can combine both of them and make like this insanely four day dice chuck fest of insanity. And I've, and even I who like that kind of stuff I'm going, Whoa, that <laughs> I'm starting like to get the sweats, much. man. You're giving me the cold sweats here. <laughs> I mean, this if is, I'm saying is... hold your horses, that's too much dice. You know, like the, the horse is gone, man. <laughs> this is something dressed up as a box of axis and allies on Halloween. It'll be like, you know, I, I'll need like counseling after that. man. <laughs> I'd probably need counseling too. Of my being. <laughs> but yeah, but it does have its place and it definitely had its influence. And then to this day, people still play the crap. I, st I see people playing that from time to time. I've seen somebody bring it to a game night and it's like, uh, do you understand that that game? <laughs> well, I almost got Carissa you... to play one because they made a World War I version of it. Oh, yeah. They've made several different yeah. versions. I was kind of curious, you know, if I anybody knew about that. any other versions being like actually actually having, you know, some interesting mechanisms to play with. Kind of like Star Wars Risk is... Mm -hmm. No, Star Wars Risk is not Risk, but it's fine. It's yeah. yeah, it's way better than Risk. I mean, it's still a dice chucker, yeah, but yeah. it's 
it's way better than risk yeah, and it's like 45 minutes of dice rolling yeah. so it's like well well yeah. let's just play it again whoops yeah. there was a fast furious only two players very different was a cl- i'm sorry i'm getting off topic um battleship was oh it, was it battleship that they changed it oh to? yeah was there was a that, that battleship the, galaxies yeah that was it that was great that, was that disappeared but yeah but anyway, talk to me. That's gotta... Anyway, sorry. Anyway, right, go on. <laughs> no, that's a good. That's a good answer to my question. You know, those versions of games that mm-hmm. that have been better. So I don't know. There's been several several different iterations of Axis and Allies, but I've never heard anybody say that anything does anything meaningfully different from a gameplay standpoint. <laughs> oh, it sounds so, like Norm says the Pacific version was tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> tolerable, yes. I praise you. Indeed. That that quote deserves on the box. It was this game tolerable. is dot 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 tolerable. tolerable. <laughs> so, what's your next one up here? Oh, should we bring Kate in for this one, or I'll go get her. You okay. Talk about this. okay. So, before we talk about the number nine here, my my daughter has some very strong. Um, words to have about this one let's let's talk about my number 10 right quick it's uh, got another female war gamer in yeah. development right here yeah so um, yeah so my number 10 and i think this is really appropriate to follow up on axis and allies is rise and decline of the third reich 1974 by don greenwood and john prados this was a game that literally took longer to set up and you never played it right you'd set it up You'd start it and be like, "There's no way we're finishing this thing." I um, oh, you're here. Okay, yeah, it, it's a it was a war game. It, it it was like the entire scope of World War II. It came right after my uh, wanting to play Axis and Allies was my next step. Mm-hmm. It's been re-implemented as um, I think Advanced Third Reich or something or other. But yeah, this is the definition. You know, when uh, Joe, when you say chips and dice and hexes <laughs> and stuff, this is it. And it, it's like the World War II in the kitchen sink, man. But yeah, I, I, I can actually say I've never actually played a full How game. How many hours is it? Is it like... It's a, oh, I, don't, I never played a full game, Joe. We'd, we'd play it and be like, well, that took an hour to set up. We play it for three hours. I think we're done. Uh, I think we're done. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. You want to sit down, Kate. So let's talk about yours. Number Kate, one. Kate, Kate, welcome to the good, the bored, and the ugly. I'm Joe. Ooh, hello, Joe. Yeah, this is my daughter, Kate. Now, I, I had a feeling that uh, when Trent actually brought this list up, that this game wasn't going to get a whole lot of love from you guys. So I wanted to bring someone on board who is one of their favorite games. So take it Yay. off. <laughs> oh, K- Cosmic Encounter is what we're going to be talking about, Kate. And Cosmic Encounter has been around for a really, really long time. So you guys have the most recent like Fantasy Flight Edition? Ooh. Yes, yes, we do. We yes. own the fancy flat version. So, did you know that the original version of Cosmic Encounter, which I saw when Tom Vassell did like the cosmic, they literally did a cosmic con um, in in uh, Minneapolis just about this one game, and and uh, a guy from a local group, because that's kind of driving distance, drove up and actually got to play in a game uh, with with uh, Tom. And anyway, they showed the original version of Cosmic Encounter, which only included like the six, because it played, I think it only played five, and it only had those five alien races in it. And that's it. There was like no, you know, there was no deck of cards. There was no like, you know, the way that they play nowadays with a hidden one and a face up one or any of that, you know, these variants and stuff. It's only five aliens. Could you imagine? Would you still like Cosmic Encounter with only five aliens, Kate? Okay, I would still like it, but probably not as much. <laughs> and a lot of the fun comes from just all the weird combinations, right? Yep. Yeah, so when I saw Trent lifted on this, he said, like, when he said, Cosmic Encounter, even though I despise it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's the favorite game of several people that, that uh, are very active. And I totally understand, like, Tom Vassell's favorite game. It's many other people's favorite games. I think that it has a place. And for me, it's just, you know, the group that I'm with is really into thinky games. And a lot of it is, uh, I don't know, it's like we we are competitive and stuff, and it's not for that. To me, it's something that I would like to bust out if I had a family that would actually tolerate my board games. <laughs> so why don't you talk about Cosmic Encounter, Kate, what you like so much about it? Like, what I really like about Cosmic Encounter is that just the diversity, the sheer diversity. You could be any alien. Each game is different with the different people you play with, the different aliens you play with. And you can just screw people up really badly. <laughs> yeah, she was, playing, she was playing a race that had mines. Remember that? Oh and yeah. And they were just like bombing planets. <laughs> yeah. it was like, 
we had a really great game where we were playing with some of Steve with but Steven and some other people were like, well, we don't, they never played it, and they've actually played games of it and didn't like it. And I completely understand not liking the game because when me and Carissa first played it as a three-player game, we loathed it. We did not <laughs> like it. it but then three, we, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we played it with more players, and it took off. And we had played a game where Kate was involved where she just hammered, hammered someone hard, and the expression on his face was like, oh, I didn't know that could happen. <laughs> we even had a game where I hosed your librarian. Oh, I was like, oh, trust me, I betray you. It was legendary. I mean, she. I mean, every time I played with the game where after that, it was like, I know how you played TC. <laughs> you even did it to your daughter? Yeah, wow. I mean, she does it to me, man. It's like... <laughs> I do How about lot. them apples, which were mentioned in our chat? The apple apparently doesn't fall far from the tree. That's a big compliment, Kate. <laughs> so anything else you want to say about it, Kate? Um, not much. I mean... What's your favorite alien? Oh, that's hard. Since it's been, like, so long since I've played it. What's your I favorite expansion? Of... Do you like any of the ones from expansions or anything? Oh, the the loser, the whiner. You like that oh, one? Oh, the whiner. Or like he's like, I wish I wasn't a hit. I wish I wasn't losing. And like, if the yeah, you, you can like go up. Yeah, the whiner. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, they give you stuff. Yeah, you had played a race where there was a couch. The couch race. Yeah, wasn't there a couch? Anyway, we played. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's it's one so of yeah, those games that, though where that type of that type of energy is just really awesome. Hey, before we're done though, this is that was our last one to talk about, and I really quickly. I noticed, TC, before Kate's gone, I noticed that you were playing L5R with Kate. Yeah. Right? Was it Dragon it... Clan or something that she rolled I, you with? I beat I beat Dad with the unicorns, man. I smashed him to the ground. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, the scorpions didn't stand a chance. I should have known. I'm like, well, no, we'll play this a little easy. And she's like, oh, my God, that was a mistake. I just got railroaded in that game with <laughs> it. Because that's what you're hyping, right, TC? Yeah. So, um, you want to hype some L5 Bar with me, Kate? Ooh, Legend I would the five... love to play it again. Okay, let's hype some Elf Legend of the Five Rings now. Let's see here. Legend of the Five Rings. It's the newest LCG from Fantasy Flight Games. It's the current dread of Carissa. Because <laughs> <laughs> she knows what kind of financial black hole I'll be going down <laughs> if I pursue this thing. So, I went, out, I, I went and got, <laughs> I got one corset. I got a real funny story about how this all fell apart. But the original, original pack my group made was we get one core set. We do the recommended um, builds for each clan, which is six, and play it twice. That'd be ten plays, and we'd know if you want to pursue it. Uh, with one core set, I built a weak deck with Scorpion and Unicorn. Weak. I was like, hey, Kate, try the Unicorns. You like them, right? <laughs> and so we talked tell about the game. It was pretty quick yeah. to learn. It, like... At first, I started dreading it because I saw the length. I was like, 45 minutes. Oh, no, the turns are going to be long. I was wrong. Like, there's these politic battles I thought were going to be boring. Everything's fighting, and the turns go really quick. So I love it. Yeah, and there's, like, you, you're, like, forcing me to lose honor and gain honor. And, yeah, so we really we really enjoyed our play with it now. It's funny I choose it as a hype because just recently Fantasy Flight announced that they're going to release like the first six packs in six weeks. I'm just like, <laughs> oh my god, That's a lot of content. A it's, lot. it's because it's another edition. There's a, there's so much for them to draw from that they can actually do this, but they didn't do that with Game of Thrones, man. That's that's wild. Yeah, and even with three core sets, you're not doing a whole lot of deck building. It's just enough to... Because you're building two 40 to 45 card decks to pilot in this thing. And so it's, I am intrigued. I'm going to try it. My daughter, I got, I got someone to play it with me. Yay. Yay. Um, my group has, some of them have already gone down this black hole. I mean, they, uh, yeah. one of Time my coworkers, wallet, right? <laughs> one of my coworkers, like, on, we bought the game on Wednesday. And on Friday, I got a message about two more cores. And oh, by the uh, way, I bought the last two from the game store. So you guys are screwed. Yeah, right. so I gotta be careful when yeah. I play. It. I I still haven't played it, man. I gotta be careful because I'm yeah. right now. I'm literally resting my feet on about oh, there's gotta be a thousand dollars worth of cards and binders and special tokens for Game of Thrones, and it has been months, man. It has yeah. been months. Even Carissa tolerated uh, Legend of the Five Rings, and she doesn't like those face to face. It was but... dot dot dot. Right, she says it's dot dot dot. Tolerable. <laughs> Tolerable, 
Nice. Yes. The the seal of approval, as we come to call it, the the ironic good board ugly seal of approval, which means the game is nah. Yeah. But my advice for like Joe, if you're curious about it or anybody listening's curious about it, is ignore the insane money that you could throw at it. I mean, don't don't get distracted by that because you'll you'll just lose your mind. Buy one core set. And I think, like well, I mentioned our sponsor, I know you can pick it up for them for about $32, right? <laughs> Just get one and try out the two-player starter deck. You'll know the rules, and then you'll know if you'll like it or not. If you don't like it, I guarantee you can flip this thing to someone who's going to want to buy multiple core sets cheap. <laughs> I could probably mm-hmm. take mine and say, hey, you want a core set for 28 bucks? Here you go, and they'd pick it up in an instant. So this, that was like the right time to try it. So if you don't like it, you can get move, get rid of it and move it on. But I'm intrigued. Normally I don't care for these type of games, but I it's this is like you know, Fancy Flight was going with role players after Arkham Horrors. Very, very clear what they were doing. With this one, it's like they're going after heavier gamers. Right, I mean, there's, there's like procedures, there's rules. It's literally like playing a board game. You have the sequence, this does that. You've got money to spend, but they call it fate right it's like yeah. it's a currency like it's fate. It's like no you're paying your guys to go out and if you don't overpay they come back why wasn't it money and eh, it's more cool to call it fate right honor that's just a way to another way to win but it's another victory condition so if you're getting smashed on your fortifications you go you know what i'm just going to drain your honor and win the game ha 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 so there's a lot to it there's but a lot of angles to take. a lot of cool. angles to it but it does it's still a card game you're still dealing with card flop you're still dealing with not drawing what you want um for me, it's going to kind of be like, you know how most people are with Warhammer uh, 40K where they're really invested in it because they're spending the time to paint their minis and all that. So they're more invested in the game. So I think you'll be more invested in L5R if you're more committed to constructing decks instead of just here's a deck to play and you're playing like, I don't know how this plays and whatever. Mm-hmm. But I think if you have that front end investment with uh, Legend of the Five Rings, you'll get a lot out of it. But it and sounds also like there's a ton of decisions while you're playing because, you know, like yeah. that's the thing is it can get, especially if you're going to play this in a tournament setting, it can, if you can play games in a tournament setting, it can get a little bit frustrating when you feel like other people are there with like decks they've just built from the internet. Mm-hmm. I mean, it sounds like this game is really more about who's running, you know, who's actually behind the panel. Uh, and by the way, TC, in our chat, I'm pretty sure you've sold yeah. an extra bunch of copies and you might... You might need, uh, to, <laughs> you know, Sorry. game surplus. It sounds like it's going to get a little bit of business here. We got Norm is like pretty much frothing at the mouth of what you're saying. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's good. It's really good. And I, I was even I went up against Dan, who like had like three core sets and constructed this monstrous monstrous unicorn deck clan thing. And I just had like a a base build of thirty, and I held my own. <laughs> and I was like, well, I didn't win, but it took him a while to get to me and I almost got him on an honor win because I almost drained his honor with my base <laughs> brain deck. But it's nice to I, have like it, multiple things to work towards. Yeah. And then I went to I went to a few launch of it, launch events in the Portland area. And they were there were people playing it. They were people going, I'm I know a lot of the concerns been will will the will there be a community around it? I'm seeing it, but again, that could just be pre launch hype, just people trying it out and be like, eh, it's not my thing. I'll have to report back in a few weeks if this stuff happens. Um, but there seems to be an interest in the community building. It won't be near as crazy as Magic or Pokemon, unfortunately, but, you know, yeah, it's there. Yeah, yeah CCGs Fan- are always going to have it, that crowd. The Fantasy Flight has definitely thrown money at this thing. I mean, they they already got tournaments. They've got, you know, world championships already coming out. And honestly... I'm probably not going to be very good at the game, but I would like to see people play it who are competitive just to see what they do. Like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so try it. It's definitely worth trying. Yeah, Is it worth the investment? It's <laughs> way too early to say. Is it going to have a community? Maybe, possibly. That well, would be people cool. seem really excited for it, yeah. man. Like this is getting people who are into magic into it mm-hmm. in, in this local group. So there's been a few guys that play magic that have actually invested in L five R, which is crazy because that didn't yeah. happen that's not happened with any previous L C G runner. No, no, no. Nope. And um oh there's something else I was gonna say, but I'll come in. But yeah, it's it's definitely worth it. it's definitely worth watching. And getting into i think definitely and like i said fancy flights in it 
Oh, and the other one I want to say is like I've actually talked to people at the tournament, the launch event I went to, who were former players of the previous collectible card version, and I didn't run across anyone who didn't like this re-implementation because I've never played the original. So I was real curious, like, if there are people who like the original who's like, this is a piece of garbage. I don't like what Fancy Flight did with it. I didn't run across anyone who didn't like what Fancy Flight re-implemented. Even, I was like, well, what about all those cards you bought? I mean, this is a whole new system. You bought all those cards. He's like, they were like, I don't care. But overall, I got, I don't care. I'm just excited the game's back. So it's got that passionate, that dedicated and passionate fan base behind it. Yeah, absolutely. I was just saying, uh, sounds like people have been really looking forward to this game for months. And I was about to type into the chat here, and I'll just say this out loud, that people at the Gen Con tournament, not this year, I didn't go to Gen Con this year, last year, we're talking about the release of L5R that long ago. So I mean, this is something that that has been, you know, this is a game that's been around and has had a lot of people interested in it for years before. And people trust Fantasy Flight now, I think. <laughs> And, uh, I, you know, I kind of think I'm going to have to play it. <laughs> well, at least play it, Joe. I'm really curious what you think. And my daughter likes it. That's, I think I'm going to really like it. That's what I'm worried about, though. Man. Yeah, I think no, I'm going to really like, like it. Like, oh, there goes Corset. Right. You know what? Yeah. yeah. You see, this This is <laughs> this, this is what I've got. My I, I keep it inside a freezer a freezer bag oh! thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I've got my feet on, and it's just binder after binder of Game of Thrones. I even have them color-coded, man. I paid like 40 bucks for these. I got all these play mats. I got, oh, I got my, I got my decks built. Yeah, and these things, these were all free deck boxes, so they are not Game of Thrones. But anyway, and then I've got, yeah, this is my Lannister, Lannister Red, and also, um, I had to fit two in one, so I believe it's also a Mar Martell, I think, Lanny Martell. But anyway, yeah, uh, just so many cards, so much stuff, and, and I haven't touched this stuff in months. And it just, it, it, I, yeah, I have such a hard time with getting back into one. <laughs> Man, yeah, yeah Junkie is right here. No, I didn't, I'm one of the, like, six core sets. I got so into it. And, but but to, to be fair, though, I owe quite a bit to this game. I had never read Game of Thrones before I got into the game, and it was the game, the mechanisms of the game sucked me into the world, and that, like, holy crap, man. Holy crap. Like, my life has not been the same. I would say probably probably my favorite book series. Well, one of them. Well, hey, I think my daughter has something she wants to hide. You want to talk about the board? Ooh, yeah, this, yeah uh, so it's my, nice. Kate is like really excited about this thing, so go ahead and mention it. In Star Trek Ascendancy, I think the Borg are coming out. Ooh. Yeah. Man. I wonder if they're just going to like, like uh, the only way to, to not lose to them is to just throw yourself halfway across the galaxy. <laughs> I'm totally going to get assimilated, man. Yeah, I, I told her. I was like, well, the only way you can be there, like a non-playable thing. The only way you can play is, is futile. Get assimilated. So I have a feeling we're going to play this with Kate, and she's going to be the fairy. She's going to go flying right into the Borg <laughs> and get assimilated and throw Borg cubes at us. Yep. It was her. It, I mean, she got you got into Voyager, right? And started 7 to 9. and Voyager. Yeah so, yeah, so here we go. There's some hype for my daughter. Borg. <laughs> what are you looking forward to, Joe? Yeah. Oh, I'm looking forward to playing the Ruhr. Uh, the backside of it is the Ohio, which I thought was just amazing. Uh, Ruhr, the Ruhr is the second version or the second game in the Cole trilogy uh, by Thomas Spitzer, being released by Capstone Games. And the thing that was amazing to me is that the Ruhr was released as a separate game, and literally the amount of components in the box were almost doubled. Um, there's a lot of shared components, but the unique components to the maps are pretty much. Uh, the double doubled the amount of chits that are used on the map. You know, player pieces are pretty much uh, du uh, used again, like all your cubes and whatnot. But I, I thought it was just amazing. I just finished a rule book last night. What I think is really cool about it is they took the way the game generally works is you're shipping and you've got like these three different options for where to ship through from the beginning of the game. You can just kind of ship whenever you want to, provided that you can get that far. Um, however, in this version of the game, the Ohio you are literally only able to ship to two different spots. You're not able to unlock the the shipping to the outside, you know, exporting to like the outer states, like the it's set in the Ohio area and these exports would be further inland to like the West and the Midwest. Maybe Iowa is one of them, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I didn't recognize the state flag, but it, then again, they were kind of state flags from a while ago. So um, 
anyway, the uh, thing that I thought was really cool about it, though, is that you, so the parts of the map are blocked off from you at the beginning, and uh, the way it's it's much more loaded onto the back in terms of the points you get for exporting. So there's a really different thing there. And then there's a new resource, coal, because you're not actually shipping coal in this one. You're shipping goods. And uh, your ship, your your coal is actually going to help you and sometimes pay for certain actions. So it's definitely taking the rur and adding things. There's not in any way that it's like just different. It's definitely it feels like the rur plus this. I guess there there's a few maybe a few different little nuances, but I think it's just beautiful. That they had the whole art redone. Most of the game is similar, but I'm really excited to try that. And I think it's amazing that they've done that as a reprint. There was a question earlier about what Restoration Games is doing with these old classic games. And I think, man, if they can kind of do what Clay is doing at Capstone Games with giving you all this extra content uh -huh. um, and still preserving the quality of the base game, there's some really cool stuff uh, that could come out of that company. And it's already happening with Clay. So I hope I hope that gives people an idea. I, I did get a chance to play the Ruhr, so I do know that it's, it's an interesting game, such a cool story. Uh, tech tree. It's an interesting way of doing tech trees I've never seen before that you have to, you know, it, it, you're thinking turns in advance. It's it's almost like a Euro with a ton more planning that I'm used to expecting from a Euro. Yeah, I was surprised when I got Arkwright that had those expansions in that, the, the capstone reprint. I was pleasantly mm -hmm. surprised to find those because I wasn't expecting That is, within heavy games, that is unparalleled. That is yeah. not something that happens to heavy games. That is like somebody who actually likes to play games and add to games, in this case Clay, who's taking a game that's already really good and then not just reprinting it, which is what so many companies do. They're just like, oh, yeah. it's it's a good game, let's just reprint it. Oh, it's been 10 years since that version came out. Oh, let's reprint just keep it. it the same, it's fine, just reprint. No, he's taking it, it's not even been out that long, but he's doubling, nearly doubling the content in the game and had the designer himself re, you know, design this and, and he was the developer. To me, it's just it. It's it's a project. It's it, there's nobody else like it in the hobby, uh, from the heavy game standpoint. Uh, the type of yeah. project I want to support. So yeah. Hey Chris, is there anything you're looking forward to playing? Come over here. Right. Oh, she says more Arkham Horror. Ooh. More Arkham Horror the next <laughs> uh, campaign. Mansions of Madness. Yeah, but you want first edition. Yes, I want first edition. <laughs> she's evil. Yeah, she's evil. evil. <laughs> ah, okay. Um. I don't think I got any more of my in. Well, yay. We got the whole family here to say goodbye. The minus, you know. Family. Yay. yay. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been awesome to have all of you on. Welcoming uh, Kate for the first time on The Good, The Board, and The Ugly. And it was really good to get to see you again, Carissa. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Yep. But if you want any of us on again, just let me know. I'll, I'll Shanghai them. I'll, I'll be get... happy to come again. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We'll just, yeah, we just got to use a little bit of teaspoon of honey to attract them. In this case, it was uh, Cosmic Encounter and and uh, Arkham Horror LCG. So you'll yeah. you'll just need to find that find the way to, to bait them on. It was great hearing from from you as well, TC. That list of games was was really. In, I, I mean, man, we talked about like twenty games in this episode. So I think that's quite a bit of content. Hope you guys enjoyed it. That have already seen it here on our YouTube channel. And anybody who listens to this when it comes out onto the uh, the actual iTunes and whatnot and podcast form. I hope you enjoy that as well. And if that's the case, then come and join and be a part of this no-name media network or whatever <laughs> we're calling it, the no-name media group. Thank you guys so much for joining and helping to fill in the hole left by Trent. Hopefully all is good for him. We'll see Andy next time. It'll be Next episode will be Monday. But that's all for this week on The Good, The Bored, and The Ugly. I'm your host, Joe Salen. I've been joined by... TC. Kate. Carissa. <laughs> And we hope you have a great week of gaming and catch us next week here on The Good, The Bored, and The Ugly.